X-Wing is a 1993 docking and long-distance commuting simulator set in the Star Wars universe, made by a small team of contractors working for George Lucas' video game company, LucasArts. It was actually the first Star Wars game made with LucasArts' involvement, as the license had only just recently reverted from Broderbund. Instead, LucasArts was primarily known at the time for its adventure games, along with a well-regarded series of World War II flight simulators made by that very same group of contractors I just mentioned, led by game designer slash programmer Lawrence Holland. This team would soon grow into the studio known as Totally Games, but at the time of X-Wing's original release, they were simply independent contractors. Once LucasArts finally had the license in hand, it only made sense to put Holland and his team's experience to work on a space simulator game. After all, the space scenes in Star Wars were heavily inspired by both real and imagined footage of World War II. Plus, only a few years earlier, a little game called Wing Commander had come along to show them exactly how to do it. Ah, Wing Commander. Now is probably a good time to mention that this is actually the second video in a series following the history of space sims. The first one being about, you guessed it, Wing Commander. You don't need to have seen that video to understand this one, but just know that watching it, either before or after, I'm not picky, will enhance your enjoyment of this video. Not to mention that it's a very nice deep dive on that game that I worked really hard on. But if you insist on being a rebel and not doing that, just know that Wing Commander was a space sim made in the year 1990 that pretty much wrote the blueprint that X-Wing and every game like it would follow all the way up until they just kinda... stopped making them for a while. And make no mistake, Wing Commander's influence is written all over this game. Which is... fair enough, I suppose. You don't have to think too hard about where most of the inspiration behind Wing Commander came from. And... hold on, can we go back to those World War II sims for a second? Are those sprite-based planes? I guess you could say Wing Commander was the first to do it in space, but come on. LucasArts was just... taking it back. And take it back they did, creating a game that sold what was at the time considered gangbusters, and started a long-running series that is still fondly remembered today. But what is it like to actually play? Well, let's load it up and find out. The first thing we get is a classic Star Wars opening crawl. Those of us in 2023 and beyond are probably pretty sick of these by now, but back then, this was probably the first one of these that most people had seen outside of the original three movies, so let's just grin and bear it. Once you've watched or skipped that, you're treated to a voice-acted cutscene. Sir, our TIE interceptors have located a rebel fleet orbiting the planet Torcana. Excellent. Prepare the attack. We are under attack by Imperial Star Destroyers. Begin evasive maneuvers. Launch the X-Wing fighters. 1992's Wing Commander 2 had already done something like this. Kazra, what is happening on Gorakar? The rebels have taken the planet, my lord. But X-Wing does a lot more of it, and makes it look better to boot. LucasArts games just seem to make better use of the 256 colors these games had available to them, in my opinion. The cutscene basically visualizes what the opening crawl said. The Galactic Empire is at war with the Rebel Alliance, but the Rebels have a fancy new ship called the X-Wing to even the odds. You must register- No, 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 I'm sorry. This is all just a huge misunderstanding. Please don't shoot me! Jeez, these guys have no chill. Once we do properly register and get into what they call the concourse, we can see that just like Wing Commander, this game uses an immersive tour of the carrier you'll be launching out of as its main menu system. In this case, the Mon Calamari Cruiser Independence. 
Unlike Wing Commander, there's no bar to be found, or indeed any characters who have anything to say to you that isn't a terse mission briefing. If you don't already have a reason to care about what's going on here from some previous experience with the universe, this game has no interest in giving you one. But who are we kidding? It's Star Wars. Of course you have an existing connection to the universe. And if you're looking for validation of that connection, you've come to the right place. They really went all out with the presentation, especially in these menus. Every available surface has been Star Wars up to the gills. There are a million different elaborate transition animations, and there's even a tech room for when you want to look at a wireframe view of a TIE fighter while various unexplained technical specifications scroll by. We're not here to browse though, so let's head to the proving ground to learn how to fly. Here, you can enter the maze, which sounds equal parts interesting and intimidating, but is actually just a very simple obstacle course where you fly through these gates for points until you've made a complete circle. This gives us a chance to try out the basic flight controls in a safe environment. And at first blush, these controls feel excellent. The turn speed is a little lower than it was in Wing Commander, but if anything, that makes it a better fit for the analog sticks on a gamepad, which is what I use to play these games. Other than that, it feels just as responsive, with no limits on how far you can turn in any direction or any other kind of filtering to interfere with your input. I had no trouble flying through the gates and getting to the end of the course under part-time. There is a small issue with the joystick controls where your ship will sometimes drift ever so slightly off course when it should be at rest. Which doesn't seem to be related to the physical controller because it still happens even when I crank the dead zone way up. It's not a problem when you're actively controlling your ship, but when you're trying to fly in a straight line, it can get a little annoying. If you're wondering why you would be spending so much time cruising in this game that I would even care to mention it, don't you worry, we'll get to it. In terms of the keys required to run your ship, this is a considerable step up in complexity over Wing Commander. Where that game mapped quite easily to a gamepad layout, figuring out how to cover all the functionality for this one took some effort. Still plenty doable though, we haven't entered crazy town just yet. Also, I made fun of this game in my first video for having an entire button just for locking your S-foils to attack position, but to be fair, now that I've played it, I have to admit, you don't actually have to memorize this button. Your S-foils start open, and there's no reason to close them, so it's just for fun. On the other hand, there's also buttons for looking out your left and right windows, and you can use them to see that the S-foils don't actually close at all. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. There are progressively harder variations on the rules to unlock separately for each of the different playable ships, but I'm already bored describing it, so I think I'll head over to the historical combat simulator to learn how to shoot stuff. Here, we have a selection of six missions for each flyable craft, plus an additional six bonus missions. The game itself describes these historical missions as the best way to learn the ins and outs of piloting a starfighter, so let's go ahead and take the first X-Wing mission for a spin. And we get a voice-acted briefing... Red One will drop into an Imperial training area in the Senex system. ...by... this guy. The target area is only two meters wide. It's a small thermal exhaust port. Yeah, him. Not to be confused with... Crix Maydeen. Crix Maydeen. Crix Maydeen. Technically, the voice acting for these briefings wasn't in the original floppy disk version of the game, but it is in all subsequent versions, including the ones you'd actually want to play. Anyway, this mission is a recreation of an experience that a young recruit who goes by the call sign Dev had, in which he was practicing in the proving ground when he accidentally activated his hyperdrive and somehow didn't notice, ending up in an unguarded Imperial training area. He assumed the Imperial equipment he found was part of his training and proceeded to go about blowing it up until his instructors managed to get a hold of him and tell him to get out of there. Now, thanks to the magic of the simulator, every new pilot in the fleet can become intimately familiar with the ins and outs of this guy's incredibly embarrassing fuck-up. I bet he feels great about this. Speaking of embarrassing, I, uh, can't seem to stop crashing my ship. It just keeps happening. Guys, uh, I think... Something's wrong with the G diffuser. You see, there's a wrinkle to the controls that doesn't really make itself clear in the proving ground. 
it takes forever to slow down. It also takes the same amount of time to accelerate, but it's the slowing down part that matters. It wouldn't really be accurate to describe this as momentum, because you don't keep going in the direction you were going, you actually just move forward, that is, the direction you're pointed in. Now, you could say, alright, just don't look at things if you don't want to crash into them, but it's not that simple. Obviously, you need to look at things in order to shoot them, and there are plenty of reasons why you would want to stop in front of something or follow closely behind it, but the amount of time it takes to do so does not feel intuitive. The crashes themselves are unreasonably deadly, where in Wing Commander, low-speed collisions were no big deal, in X-Wing, the only thing that seems to matter is the size of what you collided with, specifically whether or not it's bigger than your ship. You can survive a head-on collision with a TIE Fighter as long as you have enough shields, but if you so much as brush up against a stationary cargo container, you will die instantly. This also applies to smaller, more mobile things that are nonetheless still bigger than you. Things you might need to chase, but which have a bad habit of suddenly slowing down out of nowhere. And even if you manage to avoid crashing into them directly, that's still not always enough. See, when a ship is destroyed, pieces of debris will fly off it, including the chassis, in a random direction. It's a nice satisfying death animation, I've seen plenty of games do something like this. But just about all of them take pains to make sure it isn't gameplay relevant. In X-Wing though, that chassis is considered to have just as much mass as the entire ship did before it was destroyed. So if it happens to get flung in your direction, well, hope you weren't on a good run. It is my, uh, professional opinion that this sucks. Coming from Wing Commander, where fatal crashes were relatively uncommon and always felt like they were my fault when they did happen, having not only the frustration of having them end your mission out of nowhere, but also the annoyance of having to keep constant vigilance to avoid them is a bitter pill to swallow. Now you could just say that's how it is, skill issue and so on, and it is true that I got better at avoiding crashes as I played. But is this really what you would want to be your primary concern, often above all others, in a game called X-Wing? Is this... fun? Is it Star Wars? I don't know, it didn't really seem to be much of a problem for Wedge in the movie. Another annoyance comes from the X-Wing itself. You see, it has a rather significant design flaw that has been staring us in the face since the very beginning. It's those laser cannons located all the way out on the tips of the wings. It turns out that spacing them out like that makes it really hard to hit small targets even when they're right in front of you. Small targets like, I don't know, TIE Fighters? Hopefully that won't be too much of a problem when going up against the Galactic Empire. In the movies, starfighters are depicted as having a limited ability to aim independently of their facing, assisted by their targeting computers, which solves this problem. No such luck in the game though, the only way to shoot is straightforward. And yes, this does contribute significantly to the crashing problem. Well anyway, if you manage to avoid crashing into everything long enough to destroy it all, it's time to move on to the next mission. Watch and learn as Red Leader takes out TIE Fighters on point defense. Stay close. You're responsible for his safety while he makes his attack. Dodonna makes it sound like you could sit back and watch your Wing Leader do all the work, but we've played video games before, so we know what they're actually going to do. Absolutely nothing. While we handle everything ourselves. Guess it's time to learn the basics of CQC. Combat in X-Wing is fundamentally very similar to Wing Commander, but with some tweaks and additions here and there. Your main offensive tool is, as you might expect, your red laser cannons. Just like Wing Commander, they're limited by a recharging pool of weapon energy, although you get substantially more shots before you run out, which is nice. One added wrinkle is that the lasers have two levels of charge. You've got a yellow bar on top of a red bar. As long as you have yellow bar, your shots are fully powered. Deplete it and you start using up the red bar. Red bar shots are weaker and don't travel as far, so you can still attack in a pinch, but ideally you'll want to stay in yellow bar as much as possible. You also get a limited number of missiles, or proton torpedoes, depending on your ship. 
Defense-wise, you got the same basic forward and rear shield system, although the rate at which it recharges is slow. Really slow. But, uh... I'll tell you later. Once you've lost your shields, though, there's no locational armor, just a generic HP value for your ship's hull represented by a color changing from green to red. Enemy ships follow a somewhat simplified version of these rules. They do seem to have a finite number of missiles, but their shields don't take locational damage, and if they do have to deal with weapon energy or component damage or anything of that nature, it's impossible to tell. So those are the basic rules, but that's all theory. How is it in practice? Well, my first impression with the combat was that it seemed overly brutal. Enemy ships don't appear to be very aggressive, but when they do decide to shoot you, the results are devastating. It seems like your starting shields can take one, maybe two hits before being depleted, and don't seem to be in any hurry to regenerate, and from there, it only takes a couple more hits to either kill you or cripple you to the point that you'll soon be dead anyway. On the other hand, if you do manage to avoid being shot, your enemies are even more vulnerable. It only takes two yellow bar shots to destroy a TIE fighter, which checks out. So the mission is doable, if a bit frustrating. Imperial forces are setting up new surveillance satellites near Coruscant. They are surrounded and protected by Imperial heat tracking laser mines. You only have a few minutes before an Imperial frigate responds. This mission is what you might call a filter. I can't ignore it any longer. It's time to talk about power management. It's something that I had been avoiding to this point because it seemed complicated and I wanted to focus on learning the basics first. But as this mission proves, it's not something that can be ignored for long. If you try to take on these mines without at least engaging with power management on the most basic level, you will fail every time. See these three bars? The blue one is for your engines and determines the max speed of your ship. The red one is for how fast your laser energy recharges, and the green one is for your shield regeneration speed. Your ship only has enough power to fill each bar to half at the same time. There are dedicated buttons for adjusting the power level for your lasers and shields. Press the shields button once and it'll go up to 75%. Press it again and it goes to 100%. One more time and it loops around to zero, and so on. Whatever's not going to your lasers and shields goes to your engines, which don't get their own button. Additionally, there are buttons to take some of your existing laser energy and convert it directly to shields, and vice versa. Alright, you got all that? Good, because there will be a test. I don't think it would be exaggerating to say that this power management system is one of, if not the most influential single features found in the genre outside of its foundational elements. It was like the regenerating health of its day. Once this game came out, every space game after it had to have it for a good while. It even made its way back into the Wing Commander series. I remember this stuff frequently being used as an argument for why these games were the superior Star Wars experience for the discerning gentlemen. Not like those baby games on your peasant consoles that don't even have a dedicated button for diverting shields to lasers. Hell, it was a key part of the marketing pitch for EA's Star Wars Squadrons. As you start off playing, it's pretty straightforward. Fly around, shoot your lasers. But as you get deeper into it, you start learning how to divert energy from your lasers to your, to your engines. And whoa, guess I gotta drag the mic back out to acknowledge Starfield. Even I didn't see that one coming. Our power allocation system. Boosting power to your engines will make your ship faster. I have mixed feelings about all of that, to put it nicely, but I'm here to talk about this game, and I can't really blame it for the trend-chasing behavior of others. So what is the experience of managing your power in X-Wing actually like? God, that sounds so exciting, doesn't it? If you've only had it described to you without any practical examples, you might assume, like I did, that it's a matter of preference. You know, if you like to play defensively, you spec into shields, or if you're a real go-getter, you go all in on lasers and hope for the best, that kind of thing. But no, that's not how it works. Any real X-Wing Pro will tell you, it's all about efficiently managing your laser power. You'll want to keep that max or at two-thirds most of the time unless you're already fully charged and you're traveling. And that shield bar on the right? You can just ignore it. It pretty much doesn't matter for the most part. That's not to say that your shields themselves don't matter, they're really important actually. Which is why you always want to keep your lasers topped off and... 
Okay, allow me to attempt to explain. The first step to navigating this mess is understanding that at the default level of 50%, your laser energy and shields are not regenerating because that is the power level required to maintain those resources at their current level. Go below halfway and your shields or lasers will start draining away without being used. And conversely, if you want to actually get more charge than you already have, which you will need if you want to shoot things or survive being shot, you need to go over 50%. You can't just crank them both up and call it a day though, because that'll leave your engine starved for power, making you too slow to keep up with the TIE fighters or make it to your mission objectives in time. So, to play effectively, you need to constantly be micromanaging your power systems to make sure you have enough laser energy, shields, or speed as the situation demands. Wonderful. There is one little trick that makes keeping up with all that not as bad as it initially seems though. The thing is, even at max power, the rate at which your shields regenerate is slow. So slow, in fact, that you might as well not even bother. See, the real way to charge your shields is by converting your laser energy. If you just dump all your lasers into shields, you can get them fully charged in something like a tenth of the time it would take to regenerate them naturally and that laser energy will be back in a jiffy. Meanwhile, you could just permanently leave your shield power at half to maintain the charge. This one weird trick leaves you free to only worry about managing your laser power. 100% lasers half shields is fast enough for most fights, and you can leave it at 50-50-50 when you're topped off and traveling to the next one. In emergency situations where you need to get somewhere ASAP, you might consider setting your shields to zero while traveling because they drain pretty slowly too, but that's not necessary in most cases. Okay, ready to move on? Well, too bad because I'm not finished. In addition to keeping your shields supplied with power, you're also responsible for choosing where to direct them, like they did in the movie, see? Put your deflectors on double front. Stabilize your rear deflectors. Watch for enemy fighters. You do this with a single button that cycles this switch through front, rear, and equalized positions. You don't need to think about it too hard though. The optimal position is in the center because it turns out that outside of extremely niche situations, leaving half of your ship unprotected is a really bad idea no matter how sure you are of where the enemy is. And besides, if you're playing the power game right, you'll have enough shields for both sides anyway. But don't go thinking that means you won't be pressing that button all the time. If you want to do well in X-Wing, you're going to be doing a lot of this maneuver right here. You flick it down, up, back to the center. You press it three times. Tick, tick, tick. You do this because as you take hits, your shields become lopsided on their own. Any energy that gets added to your shields goes to both sides equally. So if your rear shields have been taking a beating but your front shields are fine, that discrepancy isn't going to fix itself but you can equalize or rebalance your shields manually by flicking that switch. It became this little ritual that I would do any time I had a moment to spare in battle. Rebalance the shields and dump a little laser energy into them if you can spare it. <sighs> All right, so now that we understand power management, we're finally ready to take on the third mission of what is supposed to be the equivalent of a tutorial. The mines are actually stationary laser turrets that fire in regular intervals at rebel ships that come within shooting range of them. There are a lot of them, and they will absolutely demolish you if you don't engage with the power management system. It only takes one shot to destroy them though, and if you're moving reasonably fast, the ones that aren't aligned with you will miss. So as long as you know the secret to keeping your shields fed, they're no big deal. So, I haven't been trying very hard to hide my disdain for this mechanic, but I can be fair when I want to. Let's look at exactly what is gained from its inclusion, and then we can talk about the cost. Ostensibly, power management is supposed to add a layer of strategic depth to the gameplay. You think, the enemies are going to be coming from behind, so I'll shift balance to rear and increase shield power, then put it all in lasers when I get to my target, and you're rewarded for your presence of mind. However, as I touched on before, it doesn't really work out that way. There are optimal strategies that don't require much thought and quickly become sort of automatic, reflexive responses to a given situation. This isn't going well, is it? I was supposed to find something good to say about it. Clearly there must be something to it for it to have resonated so deeply with so many people, including every game designer who played it, apparently. 
Hmm, I think I've got it. It's immersive. Out of all the tools that games have to immerse, one of the most underappreciated and yet most effective ones is a system that encourages players to think about the game world as if they were a denizen of it. And hey, characters in the movies do concern themselves with this stuff. I think this does go a little deeper than just, we saw it in the movie so we put it in the game though. Ships in Star Wars aren't just a simple means of conveyance, they're hot rods. Complicated, temperamental machines that nonetheless reflect their owner's personality and reward those who take the time to learn the ins and outs of how they work and treat them right with superior performance. Oh yeah? Watch this! Watch what? I have to admit, it makes a lot of sense to include a feature like this in a Star Wars game. It tracks with the approach they've taken with all the out-of-cockpit parts. If you were a Star Wars fan in the early 90s looking to lose yourself in that world, this must have been pretty potent stuff. Nowadays, if you're looking to get immersed in the world of Star Wars, well, let's just say you've got options, my friend. Personally, I'm never going to value this kind of thing unless it can pull its weight gameplay-wise. It does come with a pretty hefty cost, after all. A massive barrier to entry for new players. They do tell you that it's a thing you should know in the fine print of the first historical missions briefing. Vary your speed and configure your power system for highest impact. Because that's how early they expect you to have learned this stuff. I say have learned because they, of course, aren't going to teach you anything about how it works or even what buttons to press in the game itself. Oh no, you're going to have to crack open the old manual for that. The T-65 X-Wing is not some children's toy you could just pick up and have fun with immediately. It's a complex and dangerous piece of machinery that requires diligent training and study to use effectively. It's the kind of thing that might convince a prospective player that these kinds of games aren't for them after all. I hope it was worth it. It's tempting to say that this is just how games were back then, but Wing Commander wasn't like this. And you're not going to convince me that the X-Wing team didn't play that game. X-Wings from Red Squadron will test Imperial defenses near Sir Carpus IV. You may expect to encounter TIE fighters performing barrier defense. Engage and destroy the TIEs and then return to base. This mission demonstrates what combat versus TIEs is going to be like in quote-unquote real conditions. Sort of. Which is convenient, because now that we've actually gotten power management out of the way, we're finally ready to talk about how combat actually works. But first, let's talk TIE Fighters, which are, as you might expect, the most common enemy type, at least in the first half of the game. Standing for Twin Ion Engine, the TIE Fighter is... well, I'm sure you already know what they are and what they represent. The Empire's callous disregard for human life, their willingness to employ a strategy of quantity over quality, to overwhelm their enemies with as many hapless pilots as possible in the cheapest possible ships. This mission does a good job of establishing how that works out in X-Wing. In the movies, and in my first encounter with them, they appeared to be quite deadly in spite of their fragility. Now that I understand how shields work, it turns out that even a huge swarm of them is no match for an Alliance fighter. The thing is, you start each mission at half shields for some reason. So if you know how, you can double that. And then if you take advantage of rebalancing to make use of both sides, you could double the effectiveness of that. And just in case that's not enough, you also have another half of your total shield stored away in your laser energy. Where once each shot from a tie was potentially deadly, they are now almost trivial. One strategy that I employ often is to face tank a TIE fighter's shots on approach, secure in the knowledge that my shields will keep me protected while their lack of them won't. It only takes two fully powered shots to take one down, so if these guys are dumb enough to play chicken with me, that's their problem. Plus, it saves a ton of time to take them out while they're flying straight at you and not buzzing around you like an annoying fly. That's what the relationship between you and the TIEs feels like in this game. They're a cloud of insects flying around you and you are a fly swatter. They really aren't much of a threat to you at all, even in large numbers. But what they are good at is leading you on a merry little chase, taking advantage of their small size and high maneuverability to prolong the inevitable. It may only be a matter of time, but time is the real enemy. 
I mentioned that this mission is only sort of representative of what a real one is like, and that's because none of the real ones are as simple as just fighting some ties. You've pretty much always got bigger fish to fry. It's not a matter of whether you can beat the ties, but how fast you can beat them, lest the mission get away from you. And so, much like Wing Commander, the focus is on placing your shots, which can be quite challenging. Your lasers travel at a set speed, so you need to predict where your target will be and aim to intercept that point. X-Wing's lasers travel faster than Wing Commander's do, and the use of 3D models instead of 2D sprites makes it easier to perceive depth, but that only goes so far on a 2D screen, and the less maneuverable ships in this game end up traveling much farther away from each other on average. So the interception distance, that is how far away on the screen the enemy is from where you need to aim to hit them, can be quite far. It's far enough that it feels kind of awkward to do without assistance from the game. Nowadays, pretty much any space sim that comes out is guaranteed to have this neat little indicator on your HUD that gives you an estimation of where to shoot in order to intercept your target. As far as I know, this was first seen a year earlier in Wing Commander 2, but if you can think of an earlier example, let me know in the comments. This did not make it over to X-Wing, unfortunately. Well, okay, I shouldn't say that you have no help. In the movies, pilots rely on this tracking display in their cockpit to line up their shots. Get the target in the middle, and it's a goner. This display is in the game, but it doesn't work like you would expect. It does tell you what direction to turn in order to face the target, but it orients you towards looking directly at them, not at where you need to aim to hit them. That's nice and all, but if I need to find an off-screen target, I can use the radar to figure that out. And if it is on screen, I can just look at the screen. While it does nothing to help you get there, if you do manage to aim at the correct point to hit your target based on its current trajectory, it does light up just like in the movies. But your crosshairs on the main screen also change color when this happens, so there's not a single piece of information given by this display that isn't redundant. I'm not sure it would be a good thing to be constantly staring at this little doohickey instead of the main screen anyway, so maybe it's for the best. It feels like something's missing, but having the game at least confirm when you're on the right track does help, and you can get good at it. I felt myself improving as I progressed through the game, and it is satisfying to nail those ties. I've been laser focused on the tutorial experience for quite a while now, and I blame the game for that. There's just a mountain of knowledge you need to learn before you can even get started, and X-Wing makes no attempt to space it out over the course of a campaign the way a game might do nowadays. Now that we understand the basics, though, we can afford to skip around a bit, but before we go anywhere, we should talk about the X-Wing itself. Despite being the namesake of the game, it's not the only playable ship, and you actually find yourself in the other ones quite often, although you probably fly an X-Wing in more missions than any one of the others. You've got the slow but versatile Y-Wing, the quick but fragile A-Wing, and the X-Wing splitting the difference as the jack of all trades. In theory, anyway. In practice, the initial impression the X-Wing gives off is terrible. It appears to be, by far, the worst ship in its own game. It's those dumbass, spaced-out laser cannons. They really do make it so much harder to hit the ties. You can learn to account for them and score kills, but it's always going to be that much harder to do it in an X-Wing than it is in the other ships. This is greatly exacerbated by the early game being very tie-heavy. With hindsight, as the game started to introduce different kinds of challenges, the X-Wing came into its own as a ship just as capable in its role as the other two are in theirs. Its engines aren't quite as good as the A-Wings, but it's still fast enough to get the job done. It has four laser cannons, which counterintuitively doesn't give it any direct offensive advantage over a ship with two, but does mean you have twice as much laser energy to feed into your shields, which is a huge defensive boon. It also comes loaded with six proton torpedoes, which are the missiles of this game. You can acquire a lock by keeping your crosshair over your target for about five seconds. Or if that would take too long and you think you have a good shot, you can just launch them straight out with no lock. You also don't lose the lock after firing one, which comes in handy against tougher targets. While you can use torpedoes against other fighters, their primary purpose is to safely damage capital ships. Their lock-on range when targeting larger ships is greatly extended, allowing you to fire from outside the range of their laser turrets. 
I like the way missiles are handled in this game a lot more than how they were in Wing Commander. Having a bunch of different missile types that all lock on in different ways wasn't something I really questioned at the time, but seeing it all simplified down to a single type that can fill all of those roles depending on how you use it has me wondering, was anything of value lost with all this simplification? Not really. Not to mention that you actually get enough of them to make a real difference this time. Overall, I'd say the X-Wing holds up as a solid all-rounder. Whenever a mission puts you in one, you can be assured that while it might not be the perfect tool for the job, it'll almost always be at least decent at whatever you need to do with it. The A-Wing is a more specialized craft, optimized for speed over everything else, which makes it ideal for an interceptor role. Imagine you were tasked with protecting a helpless ship from a wing of approaching TIE Bombers, which is a situation that happens often in this game. The faster you can get to them, the better. A slow ship might not reach them before they get in range to launch their torpedoes, while a speedster like the A-Wing could take them out and be on its way to the next wave before they even get close. Another thing that will help in situations like this is being able to reliably hit the TIEs, which is much easier to do when your laser groupings are significantly closer together than the X-Wings. Yes, I really am going to keep harping on this because it legitimately does make a big difference. Despite having only two guns versus the X-Wing's four, the A-Wing doesn't suffer any DPS loss because it fires twice as fast, so the only real drawback is that it'll run out of energy faster. It also helps to be able to keep up with them when they would outrun a slower ship. The A-Wing also has a better scanner than the other two ships. Scanning is a whole other can of worms that I don't even want to get into right now. Suffice to say that most of the missions that require you to use a scanner don't give you an A-Wing, but will make you wish they did. So those are the pros, but what about the cons? Well, the main one is that it's defensively lacking. That's not to say that it doesn't have strong shields. As far as I could tell, the shields on the A-Wing are just as good as the ones on the X-Wing. Oh no, see, the problem is that it has trouble maintaining those shields due to only having two guns. Each laser has its own independent store of energy, so having twice as many guns means you get twice as much energy to feed into your shields. They also regenerate independently, so the more guns you have, the faster you get that energy back. This is never going to stop being the most counterintuitive thing. Why even bother with shield generators? Just stick another gun in there, it'll work better. Anyway, this lack of laser energy makes the A-Wing a bad choice for intense, prolonged battles because as your shields take damage, your laser energy won't be able to keep up with the demand without taking long breaks to recharge. This is fine when you're intercepting small groups of ties, you could just recharge on the way to the next group but not so much when you have to keep fighting continuously. Instead of the X-Wing's torpedoes, the A-Wing gets a nerf in the form of 12 concussion missiles. The most notable differences are that they do less than half as much damage and lack the ability to target capital ships from long range. If they're supposed to have some kind of advantage to make up for that, I haven't been able to discern what it is. I get the idea that they're supposed to be for fighters, but if that were the case, you'd think they'd lock on faster, but nope, it takes the exact same amount of time. I guess the fact that you get more of them makes them more efficient against anything that can one-shot, which does include most TIE variants. Maybe they move faster or have better tracking? It's hard to tell. I'm not too broken up over it though, so the A-Wing is no good at fighting capital ships. So what? Just don't use it for that. And they pretty much never ask you to, so it's no big deal. An A-Wing taking on a capital ship. Could you imagine? For just about the entire first half of the game, the A-Wing seems downright overpowered. This is because it's really well suited for the kinds of challenges you face in those early missions. Later on, new challenges get introduced that can take it down a peg. Even then, it still has its place. I'm just not wishing they gave me an A-Wing in like 3 out of 5 X or Y-Wing missions anymore. It's a good ship, is what I'm saying. And that leaves us with the Y-Wing, well known as the rusty old clunker hand-me-downs of the Rebel fleet. Although apparently the idea of them being slow started with this game? Weird. Well, it is slow. So slow that it has trouble keeping up with TIE Fighters. It even turns slow, which adds a whole new dimension of not keeping up. At least it has the tightest laser grouping of any of the ships, so when the TIEs do decide to fly under your crosshairs, you'll definitely hit them. So why would anybody want to fly one of these things? Two words. 
Ion Cannons. In addition to its two laser cannons, the Y-Wing has a pair of ion cannons, which can disable any unshielded ship with only a couple shots. And I do mean any ship that does not currently have shields. Disabled ships are completely dead in the water, unable to move, shoot, or do anything really, and they won't ever recover without external help. It's common for a mission to call for a specific ship to be disabled so it can be boarded, and you'll need to either fly a Y-Wing or escort one to do the job. Even when the mission doesn't specifically call for it, the ability to render a capital ship completely helpless after taking out only half of its effective HP seems a little busted, but hey, this thing is so goddamn slow, it needs all the help it can get. Other than that, it gets two extra proton torpedoes over the X-Wing 6, further cementing its role as a capital ship killer. I guess you could also use them on some asshole who's going around too fast for you to catch them. Defensively, the Y-Wing is sitting pretty because the juice from ion cannons works just as well as regular laser energy. According to this YouTube comment, the Y-Wing is actually the toughest ship able to survive being double tapped by missiles which would instantly kill an X or A-Wing. According to the in-game tech room, the Y-Wing should actually have less shields than the other ships, assuming that's what this is even supposed to mean. And it's hard to verify that, because missions where that could even happen to you, let alone in a Y-Wing, are very rare. But the tech room seems kinda iffy, so I think I'll go with the Lambda team on this one. If you think about it, the Y-Wing mainly excels at missions that were designed specifically for it. But there's nothing wrong with that. Doing the job you were made to do, or doing the jobs that were made for you to do, what's the difference really? It's all fine as long as they don't do something dumb like put you in a Y-Wing to do the job of an A-Wing just to make things harder for you. Which, uh, they do do a few times, but sometimes life gives you lemons, right? The thing that strikes me the most about how the player ships are handled in this game is how well they complement each other. In Wing Commander, they sort of half-heartedly played at giving the ships advantages and disadvantages, but when it really came down to it, each successive one was an upgrade over the last one. The way they handle it in X-Wing is so much more interesting and less frustrating. I never feel like the ship I'm flying is straight up inadequate. At worst, it's a bad fit for the job. You get a good sense that each ship has a reason for existing, and while they don't really play differently enough to make it worth varying up your tactics based on what ship you're in, they do feel different to fly, which is nice for variety's sake. There are some early game balance issues, but overall I think they did a good job here. Oh, wait a minute. There's another one? Well, this year's expansion content, and even the first historical mission with it seems ridiculously hard, so let's set it aside for now. No, I think we've spent enough time in the simulator. It's past time we went out on a tour of duty. But first, a message from our sponsor. Me! That's right, I've got a Patreon now. Remember when I said this was the second video in the series? Well, with your help, we could take it a lot further than that. Who knows, we might even make it to your favorite game. But you can't start the show with a showstopper. We gotta work up to that. So why not check out some cult classics along the way? Maybe take care of some unfinished business? And oh, how about some controversial games? That could be interesting. There's a whole world of possibilities out there, is what I'm saying. If you'd like to help realize those possibilities, I've got options for you. I'm keeping things pretty simple to start with because I got my hands full just making the videos, you understand. But I can still offer the basics you've come to expect. Give a little, get your name in the credits, give some more, and you can get me to read it out loud. Plus, subscribers at Captain level or higher can vote on the game I'll cover next. If you want to subtly, or not so subtly, guide me down the path towards covering your favorite game sooner, you can do that. If you're enjoying these videos and would like to support the creation of more of them, please check it out. Tours of Duty, which could be less confusingly described as episodes or campaigns, but old habits die hard I guess, are what make up the main bulk of the game. Each tour of duty, of which there are three in the base game, is a series of 12 or more missions loosely connected by a story thread involving some large strategic goal that the Alliance needs to accomplish. 
For example, one of the expansion tours is primarily concerned with securing a food supply for the rebel fleet. Yes, I kid you not, you spend multiple hours fighting over cargo containers full of grain in this Star Wars game. Red 1 must identify and disable any transport carrying food. Transport Raider will then deliver a commando team to capture the food. Overlord Gorin has offered to sell food supplies to the Alliance. A-Wing Red is to confirm reports of grain located at an Imperial depot. All Imperial grain containers must be destroyed. Y-Wing groups Red and Gold will ambush the grain convoy here. The Imperial frigate Elite is expecting its food supplies to arrive shortly. And it's mostly not as boring as that sounds. Mostly. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go ahead and sign ourselves up for the first tour. Good luck, sir. This one takes place some amount of time before A New Hope, when the Rebels, hot off a of major victory in some place called the Turkana system, are quaking in their boots because the Emperor is probably up to... something. Okay, kind of a generic start. And there's no cutscene either, we just get dumped straight into the first mission briefing. You get your orders from Admiral Akbar in tour missions. Yes, that Admiral Akbar. It's a trap! Isn't this guy the highest ranking officer in the fleet? Are there really so few rebels that it makes sense for him to be talking directly to the pilots? This might sound strange, because you don't know him like I do, but I think he might have an ulterior motive here. The attack against an Imperial convoy has turned up a surprise. Blue Squadron reports the escorting Imperial Corvette wishes to defect. The Corvette's crew has stopped their ship and lowered their shields. The Y-Wings will guard the Corvette until a boarding party arrives. X-Wings from Red Squadron will destroy the Imperial freighters. Do your best to destroy all of the freighters. This first mission is not a bad place to learn the basic flight controls, which makes sense, but isn't there a whole mode for that? I guess they wanted to have something to catch the kind of players who skip tutorials and jump straight into a game, but those people are in for a rude awakening when they run into some of the less intuitive mechanics not long after this. But before we go any further, let me just put my glasses on. There we go, that's much better. So the thing about this game is that there is no best version. The two versions that you would play today each have their own pros and cons, which I'll go into detail about in a section dedicated to them near the end of the video. I was going back and forth over which version to play, but once the game started in earnest, I had to make a choice, and I ended up going with what the Steam release calls the Special Edition, mostly for the improved clarity that comes from running at a higher resolution. That's what I was playing when I recorded my footage, so that's what you'll be seeing in this video. However, wherever possible, I use the DOS CD version for any out-of-cockpit stuff because I think it looks much better. Unfortunately, for reasons so esoteric, I'm not even going to attempt to explain them until later in the video. That does not include most of Akbar's briefings, so we'll have to live with him looking like this from now on. It's okay though, he's just a little melty. It could have been worse. At least it's not like what happened to Dodonna. <sighs> Rebel intelligence is expecting Empire activity in the Delos system. Rendezvous with the nav buoy and stay alert for Imperial warships. ID all spacecraft. Withdraw without engaging the enemy. The second mission is mainly a vehicle to deliver story. You get to see the scale of what you're up against, and if you pay attention to the names of some of the larger ships, you'll notice that these are the ones that you're going to be dealing with throughout the rest of the tour. In terms of mechanics, it's a gimme. Target a ship and get close to ID it. They'll take pot shots at you, and a couple ties will hang around to harass you, but as long as you know how to power your shields, it's no big deal. What's that? You don't know how to do that because you thought you could just learn how to play this game on the fly? Well, it's certainly not going to lift a finger to help you now, so have fun! Our fleet is evacuating all of our forces from the base at Bridgia. Two X-Wings from Red Squadron will fly cover for the evacuation. Several shuttles are carrying the most important personnel. Gold Squadron's Y-Wings will provide close escort for the shuttles. 
Help the Y-Wings protect the shuttles until they can hyperspace. It turns out that what we witnessed in the last mission was the staging of something called Operation Strike Fear, which appears to consist of taking a huge fleet and... using it to crush any rebels they happen to find? Great plan, guys. Must have taken a genius to come up with that one. Their first move is to attack a not-so-secret rebel base on Bridgia, so our job is to defend the evacuating shuttles. The opening of this mission is another example of the in-game mission scripting being used to convey story, with the Star Destroyer jumping in right on top of a corvette in one of the shuttle groups before you could do anything about it, ramming straight through them in the process. Maybe I'm not giving the Imperials enough credit. There's another group of shuttles closer to you that can still make it though, and for that, they send a wing of three TIE Bombers. You know these guys. They're like TIE Fighters, but chonkier and with heavier ordnance, specifically 12 torpedoes and 20 missiles, which they will begin launching as soon as they get in range of their target. The missiles are no joke. If a bomber manages to launch two of them at a bad time and you can't stop them from hitting you in time, that's it. You're done. Luckily, this is something you almost never have to worry about because 99% of the time you see a TIE Bomber, they're not thinking about you. They're on a mission to destroy some other target, usually some other target that will cause your mission to fail if they're successful, which makes destroying them priority number one whenever they appear. They will stop to defend themselves if attacked, but by that point, you're far too close for a missile lock to be practical. While it still doesn't have shields, a bomber's hull can take significantly more punishment before it gives out. So you can't just casually swat it out of the sky like a fighter. On the other hand, it's far less fast or maneuverable, and a much bigger target on screen, so consistently landing the needed shots isn't too much trouble. This is good, because you're going to be doing it a lot. Shortly after you destroy the bombers, the Star Destroyer will launch another wave of them. There are also TIE Fighters around, but they're not what matters. If those bombers make it to their target, you lose. Of course, you could take them on if you have time. And in fact, if you don't destroy enough of them, they'll probably kill you when you try to make a beeline for the bombers. This is pretty much the primary gameplay loop of X-Wing. It's a balance. You've got to prioritize completing your objectives while also taking time to carve out enough space to survive. One interesting factoid about the TIE family in general is that unlike the Rebel ships, they don't have hyperdrives. This means that they can't travel long distances without the help of a capital ship to act as a carrier. It's not just trivia. The developers took this into account when designing the missions. You will never see a TIE fighter or bomber just spawn out of nowhere. They have to be launched from a capital ship. And if you somehow manage to destroy that capital ship before all the TIEs have launched, well, that's just too bad so sad for them, isn't it? Now, technically, there's nothing stopping a capital ship from hyperspacing in and launching TIEs out of nowhere. But if that happens, at least you know where the rest of the TIEs will be coming from for the remainder of that mission. For doing such a good job saving those refugees, we got a medal from Mon Mothma. Congratulations on behalf of the Rebel Alliance. Wait, go back. What is that wink? What is she trying to communicate here? I, uh, let's talk about the medals. Just like in Wing Commander, you get promotions based on your performance, and if you perform particularly well, you get a bunch of shiny things to put on your uniform, which is a nice way of showing off how far you've come. You get a badge for each individual training mission, which makes them seem weirdly important, then a pip for each tour mission, and these larger medals at fixed points in the story. Finally, you could get little additions to the unique medals by doing particularly well in the missions that take place around the time you get the big one. They don't explain how the scoring system works, which is a pet peeve of mine and makes it a bit of a non-starter for me, but it kind of seems like the way to get most of those additions is to stick around after a mission is over and farm the stragglers for points. The Frigate Redemption is receiving wounded from the Bridget evacuation. Red Squadron's X-Wings will fly cover until the last shuttle arrives. Stay alert for Imperial Marauders and protect our wounded. This one seems very similar to the last one. An Imperial frigate jumps in and launches some bombers and fighters, so we move to intercept. But surprise! Before we can even reach the bombers, the frigate makes a mini jump to the other side of the group we're protecting and launches another wing of bombers. It's a pincer attack. We're no rubes, though. 
after we deal with the first wave, we'll just head over to the other side and... Uh, yeah. Sure is taking a while to get there. Once we've taken out the bombers and their escorts, the frigate continues to send out waves of fighters, two at a time, for a good while until they run out and leave. We can't leave yet, though. The whole point of this mission is that the wounded refugees from Bridgia need to be transferred from their shuttles and corvette to a medical frigate. We're just supposed to make sure that happens. So in order for our mission to be complete, that needs to happen. In real time. I counted about four minutes between when I destroyed the last tie and when I received the notification that I could leave. Unfortunately, this mission is not an outlier. You're pretty much always protecting somebody, usually in an obnoxiously slow transport or shuttle, who needs to dock with something else. Maybe to transfer cargo, or to repair a damaged ship, or to take over an enemy ship. First, they need to slowly amble their way over to the target ship, a process that can often take multiple minutes. Once they've successfully docked, they need to perform whatever action they came to do, which is typically a matter of multiple minutes. Once that's done, they usually need to hyperspace out before you can be relieved, which is something you'd think would be a cinch, but actually takes multiple minutes. But hey, maybe I'm missing something. Did you notice how my wingmen left shortly after the Imperial Frigate did? The way you end a mission is by going into hyperspace. If you've completed the mission, then you go to the next one, otherwise you can retry it. And hey, the mission effectively is over once the Imperial Frigate leaves. My wingmen seem to think so. Maybe they know something I don't. So let's do a little experiment in the simulator. Star Destroyer drops off a whack of TIE Bombers to attack this Corvette carrying a Twi'lek delegation, then leaves the pilots to die of asphyxiation once their air supply runs out. Remind me not to fly for the Empire, no matter how good the pay is. Anyway, all you have to do is take out the Bombers and there's nothing else to stop the Twi'leks from reaching their destination. And sure enough, my wingmen know when their job is done, so let's join them. Nope. Mission failed. Those Twi'leks somehow managed to get themselves killed by nothing the second we took our eyes off of them. I have to go now. My planet needs me. There's no way around it. The amount of time you spend traveling to meet distant enemies and waiting for allied ships to dock with each other in this game is obscene. You have to understand, there is so much docking in this game. So, so much docking. The human mind wasn't meant to handle all this docking. You spend enough time watching this stuff and it starts to take on new meaning. I've been really trying, docking operation complete. Sometimes I wish I could partake in the docking, but alas, my role is just to watch. So yeah, it's a problem. A big problem. The learning curve is nothing in comparison. It's a pain point for sure, but once you get over it, it's done. You know how the game works and you can have fun. But this? This is something you just have to deal with, no matter what. If you want to try this game yourself, be prepared to spend a significant portion of your playtime just sitting around, twiddling your thumbs, waiting. And if one of those docking sessions happens to be in the middle of a mission and you fail before the end? Hello darkness, my old friend. You want to know the worst part? It didn't have to be this way. I can say that with confidence because Wing Commander already solved this problem three years earlier. See, in that game, whenever you needed to go somewhere far away, all you needed to do was press the handy dandy autopilot button and it would play this 5 second cutscene and then you were there. But it can't be that simple, what if something comes up? If something interrupts you, you drop out of autopilot, you deal with it, and then press the button again to be on your way. But what about allied ships? They thought of that. Autopilot puts you in formation with them and takes you to their destination together. Okay, so to be completely fair, it really is not that simple. 
X-Wing scripting and mission design is exponentially more complex than Wing Commander's. It would be unreasonable to expect X-Wing's solution to this problem to be as polished and easy to use as Wing Commander's. For example, Wing Commander's autopilot hinges on the fact that the designers always know where you need to go next, so there's no need to have controls for setting your destination. You just have a single button that whisks you away to wherever you need to be. In X-Wing, the answer to the question, where do I go next, perpetually changes based on the situation and doesn't really have an objective answer. Figuring that out is part of the challenge. And there's a lot more going on with the allied ships you need to protect the next wing, all of which would complicate their involvement with an autopilot system. Any kind of solution they could have come up with for X-Wing at the time would have necessarily been a little less elegant, a little harder to use, a little more finicky. And that's fine, it's the price of progress. But to do literally nothing to solve the problem, to seemingly not even recognize that there is a problem, is simply inexcusable. Well, alright, maybe we can find a way to lay some of the blame on Wing Commander. In my video for that game, I remarked that it was like a game out of time, and I stand by that even more after playing this one. The quality of life features were implemented so elegantly and seamlessly. Dressing them up as features of your ship, like the navigation and autopilot systems, smoothing over the transition with a cutscene, I could almost believe that it was so far ahead of its time that people at the time didn't even know what they were looking at. Doesn't look like anything to me. Meanwhile, X-Wing very much is a game of its time. To be fair, that time was three years after Wing Commander, so it does benefit from a few advancements over that game. Like an options menu. That's nice to have. Apparently it wasn't always a given that a game would have one of those. And okay, credit where it's due. The save system is pretty slick. Where Wing Commander had you saving manually between missions, X-Wing just saves to your profile automatically every time a mission is concluded without asking or even notifying you. Any mission you completed goes to the simulator where you can replay it anytime you want, which is very nice. This idea of a save system that always puts you right where you left off without you as a player ever having to even think about it is very much in vogue today. The cheats that are always available straight from the options menu remind me of current trends as well. Your reward for sitting through all that docking is... a cutscene. There aren't many of these. I guess they occur at roughly the same frequency as the ones in Wing Commander, but these ones are way more elaborate, with action, sound effects, and voice acting. So they are pretty nice when they do appear. Three supply freighters are heading for their rendezvous point with the Imperial Star Destroyer Invincible. They are being escorted by a full squadron of TIE fighters and the Corvette Ranger. You will draw off the escorts by launching a few torpedoes at the freighters. The Y-Wing Strike Force will drop into the convoy one minute later. Keep the TIE fighters occupied. Stay alert for any reinforcements coming from the Invincible. You must give the Y-Wings enough time. Despite what the cutscene would have you believe, it looks like the Empire's plan to just roll in and shoot every rebel they happen to find didn't turn out the way they expected. Go figure. Time to take advantage of that by ambushing them while they resupply. Akbar makes a big deal out of the fact that you're supposed to be supporting the Y-Wings, but the only thing that actually matters is that the freighters get destroyed, no matter who does it. Which makes this mission very short and easy if you figure that out. The subtle but important distinction between what Akbar tells you and what the game is actually looking for you to do is something worth noting for later. A freighter has lost its hyperdrive while in the Rudrick system. Your mission is to be the advanced scout for this capture operation. A shuttle has been dispatched to repair and capture the freighter. Be on the lookout for pirates as well as the Empire in this sector. The Rebellion is in desperate need of astromech droids to support their starships, so it's time to steal some. But it looks like we're not the only ones with that idea. The gimmick of this mission is that you're fighting pirates with unconventional ships like Y-Wings and transport. Fighting a Y-Wing is not all that dissimilar to fighting a TIE Bomber, so that's no problem. The transports, on the other hand... First of all, the game doesn't consider them to be a fighter, even though they're sometimes used like one. So the target nearest enemy fighter button doesn't work on them, which is extremely annoying. 
Their primary weapon is ostensibly an ion cannon, but what really makes them dangerous is the fact that they're bigger than we are and are prone to slamming on the brakes without warning. Of course my first real death was going to be from a crash, how could it have ever been anything else? And yes, the game does draw a distinction between dying in the simulator and in a tour of duty. Because I was out there for real, the game does consider me to be actually dead. You must register. It won't let me continue playing. I got a little unlucky there. Okay. Normally when your ship is destroyed, you automatically eject. But the ejection system must have been damaged in the crash. If you do successfully eject, you'll either be rescued by the rebels or captured by the Imperials, which is functionally identical to death. But you do get a cutscene of Darth Vader torturing you. Now we will discuss the position of the secret rebel base. Which one you get seems to be set on a permission basis based on whether you're in rebel or imperial controlled space. Although there may be some RNG involved too, I'm not sure. But hold on, maybe we should go back to the part where I can't continue playing the game because I'm dead? That seems a little harsh, doesn't it? But don't worry, there are... ways. He could actually... save people from death. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural. Okay, but really you just click on Modify Pilot and you can revive yourself. The cost is all your points, and your rank gets busted down to Flight Officer, assuming you got that high to begin with. I kinda like this system. It's a punishment for losing that does encourage you to try to play well. I do have my pride, after all. But without affecting you in any material way, it's clever. Three X-Wings have been hijacked by their subverted R2 units. Red Squadron will send three Y-Wings to intercept and disable them. Shuttles will drop in to repair the X-Wings and replace the R2s. The Calamari Cruiser Maximus will then arrive to recover the X-Wings. These X-Wings are manned. You must save the pilots from being kidnapped. And the R2 units were booby-trapped. You know, that's actually not bad. They got us to fight a bunch of pirates over these and then they pull this on us. They must be learning. This mission is the formal introduction of the Y-Wing and its ion cannon. You've got to use it to disable the X-Wings without destroy- God damn it! You disable the X-Wings without destroying them, and then defend the shuttles that come in to rescue them from TIE Interceptor attacks. Interceptors are a lot tougher than TIE Fighters. TIE Interceptors. They're like TIE Fighters, only more so. More guns, more speed, more maneuverability, tougher hull. I'm not sure if having four lasers actually improves their offensive capability over the fighters too because it doesn't really make a difference for the X-Wing. It's hard to tell. The other three things definitely make a difference though. That extra little bit of HP puts them just over the breakpoint of dying to a single well-placed dual link shot and they're even squirrelier than the regular guys. In theory, the faster speed should make them a particularly bad matchup for the Y-Wing due to their ability to straight up outrun it at will, but that tight laser grouping is just god tier. It really does make a huge difference. Identify and disable Imperial transports bearing prisoners. Protect our rescue transports from any Imperial counterattacks. Destroy all other transports before they reach the Imperial frigates. The Celestins are stubbornly refusing to pick a side in the Star Wars. Come on guys, it's the Galactic Empire. What do you think they're gonna do when they get around to dealing with you? Luckily, the Imperials just can't help themselves and have already kidnapped a highly skilled team of Celestin techs. Maybe if we rescue them we can convince their leaders to come to their senses. There are a bunch of transports, but only two of them have the Celestins on board. Which, by the way, they don't tell you, so you just kinda have to intuit it from the fact that there are two icons on the briefing map. But anyway, the first thing we need to do is identify them. Doing that involves... Uh, scanning each of the transports until you find the right ones. Welcome to what is undoubtedly the single worst mechanic in this game by an enormous margin. We've already used scanning before, in a low pressure situation with an A-Wing. If you don't remember, the way it works is that you target a ship and get within a certain distance of it. Then, after some time has passed, the ship gets ID'd so you can see its name and what it's carrying. 
So what's the big deal then? Well, you see, the amount of time it takes to scan something is random. Or by a process so inscrutable that it might as well be. I couldn't find any information about this mechanic online. The manual has nothing helpful to say about it. One of the historical mission briefings has this. Get within 0.02 kilometers. Now, that is ridiculously close, like impractically close, and also not true, considering that I've gotten successful IDs from much farther away. This led me to believe, for a long time, that this was either a typo or the in-flight units are not kilometers and they actually meant 0.2 units, which did seem to line up with the distance at which things would get ID'd in my experience. Only sometimes I would spend ages within that range without getting the ID. Perhaps you're beginning to understand why in a high-pressure, time-sensitive situation, this mechanic might lead to some frustration. Wait, 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 I have an idea. There's no need to leave things to chance. What if I just disable all the transports and sort them out later? Wrong, you idiot. You absolute buffoon. The friendly transports full of commandos that come in to rescue the Celestins will always try to dock with the first ship you disabled, whether that makes any sense or not. No, you need to locate and disable only the correct ships, or the mission fails. So, assuming you get lucky enough to ID both Celestin transports in time, now you just need to destroy all the other ones before they can dock with the frigates. No big deal, right? There's only what, like 12 of them? And it only takes about half a minute of sustained fire to destroy them? You do have torpedoes, but those will only take you so far. Not to mention that even catching up to them takes a while, lest we forget that we're flying the slowest ship in the game. And once they get in range of the frigates, forget about it. They will obliterate you if you get too close. If you're watching at home and you actually managed to do this, my hat's off to you. That's seriously impressive. As for me, well, I noticed something a little odd on the mission results screen after failing one time. Why isn't there any reference to how many transports I've destroyed? I am supposed to destroy the transports, right? Right? So it turns out that this... Destroy all other transports before they reach the Imperial frigates. ...was a lie. The only thing that matters is that the Celestins are rescued. The game doesn't care one iota what happens to the other transports. Do not attempt to destroy them. You will fail the mission if you even try. Any time spent chasing after them is time not spent defending the allied transports from ties, which is time you do not have. Ugh, at least it's finally over. Well, not quite. Even after having finished the game, written the script, edited most of the video, there was still something bothering me. I had to know. How does this stupid scanning mechanic actually work? So, I looked over my footage of the times I scanned things, ran some experiments, and collected enough cold hard data to get to the bottom of it. However, I'm going to leave the previous section chronicling my initial experience intact, including the mistaken assumptions I made, so it can hopefully convey how frustrating it is as a regular player to just have to deal with a mechanic like this without proper explanation. When the game consistently tells you that you need to get within 0.02 units, but you know for a fact you've ID'd things from over 0.1 units before, but other times you've been closer without it working, what do you make of that? All you can do is just try things and then guess which factors are important based on what you happen to notice in the moment, which can very easily lead you to the wrong conclusions. There's a million different things that could potentially make a difference. You have to be within a certain distance, that's been established. How long do you have to be there for? Do you have to be looking at the target? Does it matter which side of the target you're on? Does the ship you're in actually make a difference, and if so, how much of one? But, now that it's served its purpose, I will lift the veil of ignorance. If you want to scan something, you need to target it and get within a certain distance. It won't work if you're not targeting the thing, but there are no other requirements. The target will be ID'd the instant you cross the distance threshold. As for how close you have to get, well, that depends on what kind of thing you're targeting. Each class of ship or object has a different distance requirement. 
These values seem to roughly correspond to the size of the thing being targeted, with bigger things able to be ID'd from farther away. Finally, the ship you're flying does make a difference. The X and Y wing are almost identical, with the Y wing consistently able to ID things from roughly 0.01 units farther away, which is a difference small enough that it can probably be accounted for by the Y wing's cockpit being further forward on its model or some other kind of confounding variable like that. The A wing on the other hand is much better at scanning, with double the range for smaller ships and almost double for the larger ones. There are diminishing returns as the values get larger for whatever reason. Putting this knowledge into practice, for an optimal scan, what you should do is instead of trying to keep the target in your sights, you fly past them. You want to get as close as possible as quickly as possible, and it doesn't matter for how long, only how close you get. So, if you fly past them, you could do this at high speed while minimizing the risk of a crash. I actually picked up on this flyby method after many hours of play, but I didn't understand why it seemed to work so much better than the more intuitive method of trying to stay within a reasonable distance for as long as possible until I did the science. Protect the Alliance and Sulustan ambassadors during their meeting. Wait, that's it? This guy, I swear. Rescuing the tech team paid off, and the Sulistans are ready to negotiate joining the Alliance which they have, for some reason, decided to do in person on a spaceship within range of a hostile enemy force. This mission is a good example of me being a big old dum-dum, just an absolute moron who wastes huge amounts of time for no reason. Did you catch it? I'm sure you did, since you must be so much smarter than an idiot like me, but just in case, here it is again. This little message right here. I either missed it or failed to comprehend what it meant. What it meant, obviously, is that the mission was a failure and I should hyperspace out immediately instead of waiting five more minutes for the rest of the mission to play out. If, like me, you're under a certain age, you might expect certain things out of a mission-based game. Specifically, you'd expect it to notify you when you failed a mission. Yeah, like that. But maybe we're just entitled young whippersnappers. We shouldn't need to be told when we failed a mission. We should check for ourselves. All right, let's check. Oh wait, we can't. While there is an objective screen, all it has is the text part of the mission briefing. The crazy part is that the thing we're looking for, an itemized list of our objectives and their status, does exist. We just don't get to see it until after the mission is concluded. And there actually is a mission failed notification, it just doesn't appear until the entire mission script has run through, which could potentially be up to 20 minutes after you inadvertently failed it. No, that's all hindsight. Your only friend in the moment is this message ticker at the bottom of the screen. If you want to know if your mission is still completable, the only sign will come from here. You better hope it doesn't get lost in a sea of other messages, or covered up by status messages generated by your own ship, or you don't just miss it because you're too busy trying to avoid being shot. And assuming you see it, I hope you studied the briefing well enough to be able to tell that this particular ship was essential to the mission. What was the briefing for this mission again? Protect the Alliance and Sulustan ambassadors during their meeting. Yeah, great, thanks. You want to know what the best part is? I was scrubbing through my footage trying to figure out what actually happened to that transport, and I couldn't find it. The message doesn't show up until over a minute after I destroyed the last tie, so it must have happened off screen sometime in the last few minutes and then got caught up in a huge backlog of messages about ties being detected or destroyed. That or it just spontaneously exploded in complete safety for no reason. Did I mention that this is one of those missions where you get to sit through three and a half minutes of docking fun before the Imperials even show up? Lovely. The Shulu Stand Leader is on board one of these Imperial Shuttles. Y-Wing Red 2 will identify and disable the shuttle. X-Wing Gold will engage and destroy the escorting TIE Fighters. Protect the shuttle while the rescue unit picks up the Shulu Stand Leader. Escort Shuttle Rescue 1 with the Shulu Stand to its hyperspace location. The Empire hopes to blackmail the Sullistans into submitting to the Emperor by threatening to kill their leader. Really? Oh no, they've got the president! 
Guess we have no choice but to turn our entire planet over to them. Absurdity of the premise aside, this is another mission where you have to ID a needle out of a haystack. But it's nowhere near as bad. The time limit is much less strict, there's only one thing to ID, and we don't have to contend with any lies from Akbar. Well, except for this part. X-Wing Gold will engage and destroy the escorting TIE fighters. But that's not important. The wild card is that instead of transports this time, it's Imperial Shuttles. And while it may not look like much, the Lambda Class Shuttle is one of the most dangerous enemies in the entire game. It's because whenever you encounter them, they're pretty much always in a large group that is just sort of sitting stationary or coming at you very slowly, waiting for you to approach. And when you do, they'll all be waiting for you, spinning in place to track you like a turret, ready to spit out a rapid fire stream of deadly accurate lasers that are red for some reason. If you can charge them down and get behind them, they'll start flying around like any other ship and it's no big deal. But before that, every second you spend in their kill zone puts you in extreme danger. And of course, you're not going to know that the first time you encounter them. Just like transports, the target nearest fighter button doesn't work on them, so they're annoyingly hard to locate in larger battles too. The Cygnus Corporation is conducting trials of their latest spacecraft. Many Cygnus scientists and Imperial observers are on hand. Identify and locate the transport with the Cygnus staff on board. Clear a path for our transport to capture the Cygnus observers. Protect the boarding craft from Imperial counterattacks. The Celestins are now on our side, and they have a plan to get rid of the Star Destroyer Invincible, which has been hounding us for much of the tour. The first step of the plan is to capture some engineers from Cygnus Corporation, the people who made the Lambda Shuttle so they can rig a captured one to appear legit to the Imperials. Our objective here is to ID the transport at, hey, is that the new ship they mentioned? It managed to escape to hyperspace, so never mind that for now. There's only one transport flying around, and you have an A-Wing this time, so that's no problem. After a minute or so, these cargo containers will start pouring ties out at an alarming rate, but they seem to be more interested in you than in the transports, so as long as you're not asleep at the wheel, <clears throat> it should be a breeze. Short and sweet. A damaged freighter carrying a massive nuclear warhead is stranded. Eliminate the mines and disable the freighter so it can be captured. Step two is to... steal a nuclear warhead? Is this Star Wars? I guess I could believe that these guys have and use nuclear power, but it doesn't feel right, does it? Well, anyway, the first part of this mission is just like the one in the simulator. Keep your shields topped off and thin them out one by one until they're all gone. Once you've cleared out the mines and disabled the freighter, a friendly shuttle will come in to capture it. Before it can leave, though, two enemy shuttles will drop in. These are here to distract you because shortly after that, two transports arrive. Did you know that there's an alternate version of the transport that has a turbo laser and proton torpedoes? Because I didn't, until this mission. If you're busy fighting those shuttles like a rube instead of making a beeline for those transports as soon as they appear, you're going to end up having to clear out that minefield again. Plus the mandatory 5 minute docking sequence, of course. <sighs> if you do manage to take out those transports in time, you can sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Star Destroyer Invincible is gone, and with it, the brunt of Operation Strike Fear. And that's a wrap for our first tour of duty. Overall, I would call this a pretty weak first act. It puts a lot of emphasis on the worst aspects of the game, in particular the docking. Oh my god, all that docking. 
I think part of the problem is that because this is the early game, they didn't want to overwhelm you with too many enemies, so there's just not that much for you to do relative to all that important business your allies are getting up to. On the other hand, if they wanted to make it easy, they sure failed with that transport scanning mission in the middle there. Ugh, I don't even want to think about that anymore. Let's move on to Tour 2. Instead of taking the failure of Operation Strike Fear sitting down, the Empire is back at it with a new project that promises to have such awesome destructive power that it could crush the Alliance. Hmm, I wonder what that could be. You and your wingman will enter near the planet Kashyyyk and proceed along the preset intercept course. We're afraid a hiding escaped rebel prisoners is being boarded by a stormtrooper transport. Protect the shuttle Drago from all enemy craft until it captures the freighter and it jumps out. Be prepared for a counterattack from the nearby Star Destroyer Intrepid. Hmm, a prison that relates somehow to the Empire's new project. You don't say. The start of this mission is a bit problematic. See, there's this transport full of stormtroopers docked with the freighter, and if given two minutes, they'll disembark and kill the escaped prisoners. First of all, I'm having a little trouble imagining how it could take two whole minutes to get off a transport. The briefing says the pilots hid aboard the freighter, but if we assume they've actually taken it over, then maybe the stormtroopers have to cut their way in? So sure, fine, I guess. More importantly though, I was very confused about how to actually do this at first because the hit detection doesn't really seem accurate enough to differentiate between the transport and the freighter. Nice shot, and destroyed. yes, but you still need to shoot the transport before the two minutes are up. And before you ask, which version you play makes no difference here. I found I had better luck getting my lasers to register on the correct ship if I shot them from further away. Once that's done, it's a standard defend the shuttle mission. Evade the Empire's latest fighter, the assault gunboat built by Cygnus. Eliminate the TIE fighter escorts and quickly identify the freighter. Support the Y-Wings in disabling the freighter with the Wookiees on board. Protect the rescue transports from any attacking Imperial starfighters. Beware of reinforcements coming from the Star Destroyer Intrepid. It's time to rescue some Wookiees who are on their way to a slave labor camp so they can hopefully tell us something about what they were going to be working on. Why would they know anything about it before they've arrived? Well anyway, now we get to fight the new ship that was teased near the end of the last tour. And no, we're not going to evade them. Ignoring them won't make them go away. Asshole. The Starwing Assault Gunboat, which as far as I could tell was invented for this game, is basically the opposite of a TIE Fighter. It's big, slow, and not just heavily armored, but also shielded. It kinda looks like a streamlined version of the Lambda Class Shuttle, which makes a lot of sense when you consider that they're both made by the same company. Their slow speed and lack of maneuverability make them particularly bad at dogfighting but they can be dangerous on approach. This is because they carry 16 concussion missiles, and unlike TIE Bombers, they're very willing to use them on you. When a missile is locked onto you, if any allied fighters are around, they'll verbally warn you about it. Red leader, incoming missile! Red leader, incoming missile! Red leader, incoming missile! Which I thought was a nice touch. If there's no one around, you get a text-only notification from your astromech, which kinda sucks to be honest. You pretty much always have someone else with you, so it's not a huge problem, but still, you couldn't just like, beep at me? You're an R2 unit, that's supposed to be your whole thing! Once you're aware of it, you can press a button to target the missile, and if you're fast enough to get your sights on it while it's coming straight at you, destroy it. You could try to juke it, but that's a mistake. These things will follow you to the ends of space, and once they're orbiting around you, I found them nearly impossible to hit. Because of how fast they move, the delta between where they are and where you need to aim to hit them means you literally have to shoot while they're off screen. If things have gotten to this point, trying to avoid the inevitable is such an enormous waste of time that it's usually better to just take the hit and move on with your life. And probably the most important feature of the gunboat is something we saw in Tor 1. It has a hyperdrive. This has implications for the mission design of the remainder of the game. 
but we'll get to that when we get to it. The experience of actually fighting a gunboat pretty much always goes something like this. Once you've dealt with the missiles on approach, you just sort of lazily follow behind them, steadily pumping them full of lasers until they die, doing your best not to rear-end them. This makes them a good example to use when talking about the game's damage effects, or lack thereof. In any game about shooting things, it's important to have the things you're shooting react in a satisfying way. Would you destroy a ship? I'd say they do blow up pretty good. There's a nice explosion sprite, and instead of generic scrap, the actual pieces of the ship go flying off every which way. But there's more to hit feedback than making a good death animation. It's just as, if not more important, to have each hit before the enemy dies be a source of satisfaction. This is something I praise Wing Commander for, and with good reason. That game had two different sound effects depending on whether you hit a ship with shields or not and ships would start to leave trails of fire and sparks behind as their hull took damage. In X-Wing, you get this, and only this. A hit spark and this sound effect. It's not bad. Probably better than either of the ones used by Wing Commander, to be honest, but I'd still take them over it, because the alternative is to get literally no audio or visual feedback to indicate whether a hit was absorbed by shields or not. The only way to tell if a ship has lost shields is this status message in the target window. You could maybe chalk some of this up to limitations born from the decision to go with 3D models for the ships instead of sprites, which is an important step that needed to happen, but it's still pretty disappointing, especially in a game where you spend a not insignificant amount of time doing this. What is perhaps a bigger source of disappointment comes from within my own ship. Just look at this. The sound effect isn't bad, but isn't it a bit... slow? Something I've noticed after playing a bunch of games like this is that each one tries to come up with its own way to prevent your basic laser attack from being too powerful. Wing Commander's solution was to severely limit the amount of times you could shoot before running out of energy, which was annoying to be fair, so it makes sense to try to come up with an alternative. In X-Wing's case, they go after your rate of fire. It works from a practical gameplay perspective, but it just feels bad, man. You could dual or quad link your lasers to fire them at the same time, but that decreases your fire rate even more to compensate. It's definitely not accurate to the movies, but more importantly, it leads to this feeling of... impotence. I don't think it's controversial to say that in your space fantasy fulfillment game, it should feel good to unload your, uh, laser gun. And this ain't it. Pretty much every other Star Wars game I've played does a much better job here. Even something as simple as doubling the fire rate while having the damage to maintain the same DPS would go a long way here. Follow your wing leader to the ComSat rendezvous point. An Imperial convoy is expected to jump in from hyperspace. First attack the corvettes, shuttles, and transports. Then destroy the supply freighters and hyperspace home. Documents found aboard the freighter point to the location of a convoy carrying materials to be used for the secret project. We still don't know what it is. I mean, what could it possibly be? But we could at least delay its construction by destroying this convoy. This mission, a little under halfway through the base game, is the first time we're tasked with destroying a capital ship, which I think is telling of the attitude this game takes toward them. I went on a tear about capital ships in my Wing Commander video over their abysmal representation in that game, and ended up declaring that it was a mistake to let you use a fighter to destroy a cap ship in any game. Well, after playing this game, while I do still think it's kinda silly, I've softened my stance a little bit. Depicting large ships is one area where the move from sprites to 3D models really pays off. While they're still significantly smaller than they are in the movies, the sense of scale is so much better than it was in Wing Commander, and the addition of perspective allows you to interact with them in a way that doesn't feel broken. People in my comments have pointed out that these space battles use naval warfare as a metaphor, and in that context, it's not implausible at all for a single fighter plane to sink a huge capital ship, which is fair enough. But for me, it's not about realism. A key pillar of the fantasy that these games are built on is the awe-inspiring scale and power of these massive, nigh-invincible warships. Just look at the very first shot of Star Wars. All of Star Wars. 
What did they choose to emphasize when introducing us to a galaxy far, far away? Is it the main character? Is it a Jedi with a lightsaber? No, it's the mind-boggling size of a Star Destroyer. So, a game that trivializes capital ships is undercutting the fantasy behind it all. That's why, more than any technical improvements, what impressed me about X-Wing's handling of capital ships was its commitment to making these things actually dangerous and imposing. It's not like we haven't encountered any before now. We've been dealing with frigates and destroyers throughout the game, launching wave after wave of ties at us and absolutely ripping us to shreds if we made the mistake of getting too close. It's just that the idea of actually taking one on has been unthinkable until now. Of course, this is our first time, so they start us off small with two Corellian Corvettes. You know, the ship that was dwarfed by the Star Destroyer in that iconic opening shot. The reason why it and other capital ships are so dangerous is that they're covered in free-aiming laser turrets. The lasers are emitted from fixed points on the ship, though you can't actually see or damage the turrets. But hey, it's 1993, I'll cut them some slack. Corvettes have significantly less guns than the bigger ships, but still more than enough to ruin your day. However, Corvettes in particular have a unique weakness, a blind spot directly behind them. If you can manage to sidle up right next to their engine block and stay there, they can't hit you. And you could dump your lasers into them until they blow. It's very silly, but there's at least a bit of a skill check involved. They can shoot you before you get close enough, so you'll want to go as fast as possible, but stopping in the sweet spot before you crash can be quite tricky before you get the hang of it. One thing to watch out for is that capital ships can still shoot you for the duration of their 5 second long death animation, so uh, watch out for that. Of course, the ideal way to take out a capital ship is from outside of laser range, with torpedoes. It only takes 6 to down a corvette, so between you and your wingmen you should be able to take them both down without putting yourself in danger. It's just nice to keep the blind spot thing in mind for later. A stolen freighter full of the Empire's latest model of Comsats is the target and is being pursued by stormtrooper transports escorted by armed shuttles. Your Y-Wing will engage and destroy the pursuit forces and disable the freighter if necessary. When the freighter is disabled, the shuttle Wilsey will arrive to board and capture it. We still don't know anything about the mysterious project, so let's steal some communication satellites and see if they can pick up anything about it. There's nothing really remarkable about this mission other than the game just straight up admitting that shuttles are one of the hardest enemy types. You take out the shuttles and stormtrooper transports, then disable the freighter and defend it from ties after the Star Destroyer Intrepid arrives. Next. A freighter carrying satellites is waiting for the cruiser Maximus. The Maximus has been delayed, so you are to watch over the freighter. Ten minutes of shooting down ties followed by five minutes of docking. At least the docking happens at the end, so you don't have to sit through it again if you fail. While we wait, let's talk about the damage system. If your shields are down and you take another hit, it's possible for various components and systems on your ship to be damaged, such as your shield generator or engines. It's clearly inspired by the damage system from Wing Commander, but it is significantly streamlined in comparison, which ends up being both for the better and the worse. You can see all the systems that can be damaged on this pause screen and determine the order in which your astromech will repair them, which is nice. It's not possible for any of these components to be irreparably damaged, which I think is a very good change because it means you always at least have a chance of recovering. Aside from these named components, parts of your cockpit can get smashed up, and this can't be repaired. It's not just cosmetic either. Stuff like your power meters and shield display can break and then you won't be able to read them anymore. Technically you don't need to be able to see these displays to use their associated systems, but it still sucks to have this happen. And if your targeting display breaks in a mission where you need to identify a specific target, then you really are screwed. And that's not the only way in which it's more punishing. In Wing Commander, a system could take damage without going completely offline, so it would perform worse but still work. There's no such thing as partial damage in X-Wing. If a system is hit, the only variable is how long it'll be offline for. And if that happens to be your engines or shield generator, you could pretty much kiss your ass goodbye. There also just aren't very many systems. 
Wing Commander got pretty granular here, with tons of different doohickeys that could be damaged, with all sorts of effects that ranged in importance, which effectively functioned as a buffer making it less likely for any given hit to completely ruin your day. In X-Wing, the chance of being left dead in the water is much higher. Sometimes what a system needs is more complexity in order to be truly elegant. Escort the freighter Ohai and a transport to their rendezvous with the Alliance Corvette Jeffrey. The Jeffrey will distribute the commsats, and a secret outpost will monitor them. Be on alert for Imperial patrols. This area of space is very close to Imperial starship traffic lanes. Uh, Akbar, Buddy, you okay? They're really making a big deal out of these satellites, huh? That's three missions now. Wave after wave of gunboats will come in two at a time, and eventually a few transports will try to sneak into... Well, I'm not really sure what they're trying to do. They don't seem to be carrying anything. Yes, the Death Star plans. How did they get the Death Star plans? Is there a single question in Star Wars with more contradicting answers than this? It was always the first thing everybody thought of when they sat down to write a Star Wars story, and nobody ever thought to check if someone else had already done it. Hopefully now that Rogue One exists, we can move on to answering other questions. Like what's the deal with those Bothans, huh? Many Bothans died bring us this information. X-Wing Blue is stranded in space. Watch over him until help arrives. So you're telling me that the one time we've ever seen an X-Wing spontaneously break down in the middle of space, it just happened to be the one carrying the Death Star plans? Approximately 3,720 to 1! Never tell me the odds. Waves of gunships will jump in three at a time to play with you, and every once in a while a shuttle will try to sneak in and board the X-Wing. I think we're starting to establish- are you kidding me? Well, at least it can't get any worse than that. Oh. I want the record to show that the lasers that destroyed the plans and lost us the war came from this guy, not me. Speaking of AI, well, I wouldn't call it bad exactly. I mean, it's functional. It does manage to avoid looking outright stupid most of the time, which is impressive in its own right, especially back then, but it's not... good. Enemy fighters will employ various maneuvers to make themselves harder to hit, but there's more to a dogfight than just not being hit. You also need to hit your opponent. Ideally, you want to get behind them, but failing that, you can at least turn to face them so you can get a shot off. But these ties don't really seem interested in doing that. It often feels like the enemies in this game aren't even trying to win, they're just delaying their loss. One of the A-Wing's historical missions is a series of duels with pilots of escalating levels of skill, all the way up to aces. So apparently the game does model pilot skill in some way or another, but as for the difference between the lowest and highest skill pilots, it's genuinely hard to tell? I guess the ace pilots shoot more often and more accurately? It's a pretty far cry from Wing Commander's aces pulling out recognizably unique behaviors that you don't see the regular pilots doing. It's pretty telling that I had no trouble completing this mission even before I started the first tour of duty. Okay, I did die once, <laughs> but you'll never guess how it happened. Occasionally I would notice ties with yellow markings on them, and my best guess of what that means is that they denote higher ranking, more skilled pilots, but hell if I know. 
Enemy fighters are at their most dangerous at the very start of a fight, when you're both flying straight towards each other. That's when they're all facing you. Once you've flown past each other and are in a melee, they become non-factors. I think I pegged five or more enemy fighters at once in Wing Commander as a death sentence, but in X-Wing, that's the minimum amount you have to get to before a battle is chaotic enough that an enemy might occasionally get a shot off at you. Most of the time, the simple act of turning towards an enemy to try to shoot them is more than enough to throw off any would-be pursuers. I also said that Wing Commander is not a game where you blow away enemies by the dozen, and, well, X-Wing is. You end up shooting down a lot of ties over the course of any given mission, so it would be prohibitively difficult if each one was as adept at flying as the average Kilrathi. But that doesn't make fighting them interesting. On a fundamental level, the dogfighting action is not as deep, challenging, or exciting as it is in Wing Commander. That's not to say the game has no challenge, it just comes from elsewhere. High level gameplay in X-Wing is all about the missions. Each one is a unique clockwork puzzle to solve, and figuring out where to be to respond to each threat as it appears can be quite tricky. I had quite a few mission failures because I couldn't get to the mission objective in time, and just as many deaths happened as a result of me not taking the enemy fighters seriously enough and trying to ignore or brush them off in favor of speeding to the objective. But that's the core of the difficulty in X-Wing, figuring out how to balance the urgent need to attend to your objectives with your own need for self-preservation. When it works, flexing your ability to sift through the noise of the battlefield and coming up with a plan to tie it all together can be... satisfying. It doesn't always work though. After all, every mission is unique, and not all were created equal. Sometimes a skill being tested isn't some fundamental axiom of strategy, but your ability to have already played Tor 5 Mission 2 and made note of the fact that at about 4 minutes remaining, a group of transports will spawn behind your escort targets and you need to be in the right place to stop them from launching torpedoes immediately. You can't really solve that one from first principles. Find the freighters with the hyperdrive cargo, then destroy them. Get through the TIE fighters and any other defense encountered. While we were dealing with our engine trouble, the Imperials had it much worse. Somebody crashed a frigate into the Intrepid, so now it needs to have its hyperdrive replaced. How did they manage that? Guys, you're in space. You have, like, infinite room to maneuver. Then again, I guess I'm not one to talk, am I? Destroy the freighters while fending off TIE interceptors, and the Intrepid will be left stranded. Lead your Y-Wing squadron in an attack on the Intrepid's escort. An X-Wing will help by providing close escort for your squadron. Seems pretty self-explanatory. This one's a lot like that earlier mission with the Corvettes, only now there are three of them. And instead of ties, there are gun bu- I'm sorry, what? In a way, I'm glad to see I'm not the only one with this problem. Make your way through the Star Destroyer Intrepid's TIE fighter defenses. Then destroy both of the Intrepid's shield generator towers. A-Wings will escort you in, while the Y-Wings make a frontal assault. It's finally time to finish off the Intrepid. I think they've done a good job of establishing how big of a deal it is to actually take on a Star Destroyer. It's only thanks to a very lucky break and two missions worth of preparation that we can even attempt this, and it's a real team effort. We've come a long way from where we were just three years ago. Even after destroying the shield generators, you don't have enough torpedoes to finish it off. When you don't have a blind spot to take advantage of, trying to fight a cap ship with lasers is a loser's game. It's a matter of attrition. If you're close enough to hit them with your lasers, they can hit you with theirs. And you have to fly straight at them to attack. It's a DPS race with someone who has a lot more guns and armor than you. You can break away and recharge your shields, but massive ships like Star Destroyers or Frigates have enough hull strength that it takes forever even when you're just continuously unloading into a disabled one, as well it should. If you're having to do this every few seconds, well, I hope you brought snacks. No, you're gonna want to rely on your fellow rebels here. In my case, the ones I came in with weren't doing too hot by the time I was able to take out the shield generators, but there's more in reserve waiting to show up once the first team is destroyed. As long as you do your job, they should be able to seal the deal eventually. Locate Princess Leia's corvette so a shuttle can deliver the Death Star plans. Then see that our corvette makes it safely out of this sector. 
The part where you have to find the red Corvette is not great. They're spaced pretty far apart, so that's a lot of travel time with nothing else to occupy you unless you get lucky and find it first try. Once you do, a Star Destroyer will show up, but for some reason only gunboats will be sent to try to stop the transfer. You know the drill. This one's a little weird in that the cutscene plays after the penultimate mission, with the final one presumably leading directly into A New Hope. Here are the secret plans, Princess Leia. I will bring them safely to Alderaan. I have you now. Protect Princess Leia's corvette until it reaches hyperspace. Intercept and attack approaching TIE squadrons with your A-Wing. The Star Destroyer Immortal is out to capture Princess Leia's corvette. Is it just me, or did they put these in the wrong order? They'll be sending interceptors and bombers in addition to gunboats, but otherwise you're just defending the Tantive IV again. And that's the second tour done. I'd say it's an incremental improvement over the first one. The introduction of the gunboat adds a welcome bit of enemy variety. There's a lot less waiting around, mostly because there are more enemies to keep you busy, but still way too much. And despite being more challenging overall, I found it less frustrating, probably because they didn't abuse the scanning mechanic too much this time. It kind of feels like they made these tours in order, learning a little bit about how to make a better one each time. No idea if that's actually the case, but I'd believe it. Moving right into Tour 3, there are no surprises here. The Death Star is out of the bag, and now we get to see what the Rebels were up to while Luke and friends were having fun on Tatooine. Protect a military rendezvous from attack by Imperial fighters. Intercept Imperial TIE fighters and TIE bomber squadrons. Starting with the transfer of stolen Death Star materials from a freighter to a Corvette. Exciting stuff. We get to defend them from a surprisingly low number of fighters and bombers, and they even gave us an A-Wing to do it. I guess they wanted to start things slow at the beginning of each tour. Your flight leader, Red One, will attack the Corvette and repair dock. You are to destroy all the smaller ships and any defenses in the area. Okay, never mind what I just said. This is quite an escalation from the last time we had to clear out a minefield. Now we have enemy fighters and a corvette shooting at us while we do it, followed by a frigate jumping in to send out more ties after a while. Though in hindsight, I probably should have dumped all my torpedoes into the corvette from the start, since the other guy is pretty bad at his job. That would have made things a lot easier. An Imperial military transport is disabled and stranded. Protect the shuttle hunter while it boards and captures the transport. This mission. Oh boy. This mission. I spent a long time on this one. It's a pretty good microcosm of everything wrong with the mission design in this game. Well, except for all the waiting. In fact, this mission marks a turning point after which they found a partial solution to the waiting. It's just that the cure may be worse than the disease. But alright, let's examine the mission in detail. There's an already disabled transport full of Imperial officers who may know something about the Death Star. Our job is to protect a shuttle as it deploys a team of commandos onto the transport to capture it. Then protect the transport itself as it very slowly makes its way into the hangar bay of a rebel frigate. Trying to stop us are six gunboats. Take them down, and another three gunboats arrive. And another three gunboats arrive. And another three gunboats arrive. And it just keeps going like this. And I can't keep up with this. I'm taking them down as fast as I can, but there's so many of them, I can't possibly stop them from destroying the transport. Or whatever they're doing to it. There's so many messages going by all the time, I can't even tell. But even when I make it all the way to what should be the end of the mission, it ends in failure, so that's fun. Okay, so what's going on here? Is this some kind of infinitely respawning gunboat? Well, yes, but also no. Let's pull back the curtain for a moment. You may have noticed that every non-capital ship in the game has a little designation as part of their name. Rebel ships get colors, while Imperials get Greek letters. These designations, uh, designate that this particular ship is part of a group. If we go back to the beginning of the mission, we can see that there are two groups of three gunships, Mu and Ro. There's nothing special about Mu group. Take them out and they're gone. 
but as soon as you destroy the last member of row, another group of three rows arrives. This is because row group is scripted to have multiple waves of reinforcements. This is actually very common throughout the game. Let's pretend Star Wars is real for a minute. Assuming there was some reason why a Star Destroyer couldn't just scramble all the ties it's willing to commit at once instead of in waves of two or three at a time, the way you would expect it to go is, they launch three ties, then after a minute or so they launch three more, then, regardless of how many ties are already out there, after another minute they launch three more until they run out. That's the simplest and most logical way to do something like this. That's not how it works in X-Wing. A Star Destroyer will show up and launch a few different name groups of ties. As long as those ties are intact, the Destroyer will never launch another one. But when you destroy all of a given group, it'll launch a set of reinforcements with the same name pretty much immediately. And it'll continue to do this as you destroy those reinforcements until it runs out of reserves. I'm going to call this the Wave System. There are a few reasons why someone designing missions for a game like this might prefer this way of doing things to the time-based method I outlined earlier, but the one I want to focus on is difficulty balancing. With time-based reinforcements, a struggling player might fail to destroy enough ships before the next wave spawns and become overwhelmed by having to deal with more and more of them at once, while conversely a pro player might clear them out too quickly and end up with an empty battlefield and an even easier time taking out the next wave with no distractions. By scripting the reinforcements to only come when a given group is destroyed, they could ensure that no matter how quickly or slowly a player destroys the enemies, the enemy density will always be roughly the same, and so, in theory, everyone will have the same experience. Its function is pretty similar to that of rubber banding in a racing game if you think about it, and it runs into all the same pitfalls that rubber banding does. Is it really a good thing to try to muddle the connection between my performance at the game and with my performance in the mission? If I bust my ass to shoot down all the ties in record time, you're damn right I want an easier time with the next waves. I deserve it. In the same way that if I drive like hell, I want to enjoy being in first place. I earned that lead. Why are you taking it from me? And then there are the unintended knock-on effects. Oh boy, the knock-on effects. The effect of the wave system is not infinite. Eventually, the Star Destroyer will run out of ties to send out and leave. If you were to graph the way a battle plays out, one managed by time-based reinforcements would generally play out something like this. The amount of action would vary over time, with spikes of intensity and lulls in the action happening at unpredictable times based on how quickly or slowly the player deals with enemies. With the wave system, it looks more like this. Roughly the same intensity at all times, but the battle ends at an unpredictable time based on how quick the player was. So what happens when a battle ends really early? Well, in X-Wing, it's mainly a lot of docking. See, the majority of the missions in this game consist of us protecting some number of allied ships as they perform a series of tasks. They're the important ones, we're just there to facilitate them. So if we finish our job before they finish theirs? Well, that stuff still needs to get done in real time. Yes, that's right. The wave system is a big contributor to all that waiting I was complaining about earlier. It's not the only one. There's lots of travel time, and some missions make you sit through elaborate docking dances before a single Imperial even shows up, but a significant amount of the waiting in my playthrough was punishment for doing too well. But not to worry, the X-Wing team is on the case. The wave system is the cause of the waiting, but what if, hear me out, we use the wave system to fix the waiting? After all, when you only have a hammer, all your problems start to look like nails. So we come back to Gunboat Group Row in Tor 3 Mission 3. This is, ostensibly, the solution to my boredom. What if a fighter group had like 50 waves of reinforcements. Then the fun never stops, right? It's not literally an infinitely respawning enemy, but for the purposes of the mission, it effectively is. Even if your aim is perfect, it takes a certain amount of time to destroy a gunboat, no matter what. So it doesn't matter how well you play, there will always be gunboats flying around for the duration of the mission. Assuming you win, the battle keeps going long after the mission is complete, so there's never a dull moment. 
This is the wave system taken to its logical end point. If you'll indulge me going back to racing games for a moment, a little bit of rubber banding is annoying, but can be overlooked. It weakens the connection between your skill at racing and your placement in the race, but it doesn't destroy it. Your skill at driving is still what ultimately determines your place. But what happens if you crank the rubber banding up to the max? Can you reach a point where your driving skill is no longer the most significant factor? What skill is even being tested at that point? I remember hearing somebody talk about one of the burnout games, or maybe it was Need for Speed. The AI only rubber bands when you boost, so if you want to win when you're behind the pack, you should boost as much as possible. But when you get to first place, never boost. As long as at least one enemy from a group is intact, the next wave will never come. So if you disable one of them and then order your wingmen not to attack it, you can stem the tide. That's the advice I got from GameFAQs for this mission. It almost worked. The problem is that after a while my wingmen seemed to forget about their orders and would destroy it anyway. And then the avalanche of gunboats would resume. Somebody on YouTube suggested sending all my wingmen home, which almost certainly would have worked had I not found another comment with an even better suggestion. The Imperials only care about the transport, and only after it gets captured. So if you order the commando shuttle to wait at the start, you can deal with the enemies at your leisure, and tell them to finish the job once it's safe. We're not thinking like an X-Wing pilot anymore. We're thinking like a mission designer, or a QA tester. We've transcended the boundaries of play, and somehow ended up at work. Your flying skill isn't the most important thing here. Meta knowledge, that's what's being tested. Your ability to discern how the mission scripting system works and think of ways to abuse it, or learn from somebody who did anyway. Winning this way isn't just unintuitive, it's boring. Well, anyway, at least now I can get a better look at the transports that jump in every few minutes to try to board. Wait, the what? Did you notice them? Because I didn't the first few times, the only notification you get is in the form of a message, which I happened to miss because I was a little busy with the non-stop gunboat action. And also, it was sandwiched in the middle of all the message spam that was happening as a result of said action. And so we peel back the next layer of the problem. Yeah, that's right, it's got layers. Like an ogre. What if I were to tell you that this mission isn't as bad as I've been making it seem? But that actually makes it worse. Allow me to explain. Let's put our mission designer caps back on. Those named groups? Each one has a mission. That mission could be a generic search and destroy, or it could be to destroy a specific target, or dock with it, or so on. The mission never changes and applies to all members of the group. So if TIE Bomber Alpha is trying to launch torpedoes at a specific target and you stop them, the next wave of TB Alphas will also try to go after that same target. This means that most of the enemies in any given mission aren't just making a beeline to your escort target. They're here to fight you, or your wingmen, or maybe even the escort target if no one else is nearby, but they're not making a point of it. However, somewhere among us are groups who make it their life's mission to end your mission by going after whatever you're escorting. These are the ones you actually have to watch out for. All the rest are noise, there to distract you from the real threat. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that correctly identifying these party poopers is the single most impactful step you can take towards successfully completing a mission. Sometimes it's obvious from context. If you're defending a capital ship and a wing of TIE Bombers launches, you could probably figure out what they have in mind. Other times, it's not clear at all. You might have one out of the five active groups of TIEs in a mission secretly plotting to ruin your day. And figuring out who's sus isn't as easy as you might think. They're not so single-minded as to immediately give themselves away. Ships on a mission will pause to defend themselves if threatened, behaving very similarly to any other enemy at first glance. The point is, as a first-time player, there is no way to know for sure which enemies are mission critical and which aren't. Therefore, it's only reasonable to treat them all as mission critical. 
This is how I played most of the game. I would prioritize obvious threats like bombers or stormtrooper transports whenever I noticed them, then try to take everything else out as fast as possible in the meantime and hope that was enough. To be fair, for much of the game, it was. These respawning gunboats put a bullet in that strategy. It doesn't matter how fast you are, it'll never be enough. Your only option then is to specifically focus on the mission critical enemies whenever they appear. But how do you know which enemies are mission critical? What's the path to figuring that out supposed to be? I'll tell you how people actually do it. Let the escort target die and make a note of who killed them. Or better yet, break open the mission designer and find out for sure. Eventually though, you sort of develop a sense for it. When I recorded this footage, I had no idea what the threat was, so I tried to clear the board as fast as possible. Looking over the footage now though, it's obvious to me. These gunboats don't care about the escort target. The only thing that actually matters are these enemy transports that come in, probably to try to capture it. My reasoning is that it would be nearly impossible to complete the mission if the gunboats did go after the escort target. Thinking like a mission designer again. Are we having fun yet? They could have dropped a hint in the briefing. Something like, These officers are vital to the project, so the Empire will almost certainly try to recover them alive. But no, you get no information about what you're up against. This kind of vagueness is all over the game, and it sucks. I've been complaining a lot about the mission design in this game, because there's a lot to complain about. But I want to take a moment to switch gears and give it a bit of praise. The reason why it's even possible for most of these problems to exist is that the mission design in X-Wing is orders of magnitude more complex and expressive than what we found in something like Wing Commander 1. Missions in that were so simplistic that I basically considered them separate from the story. You would go out to blow up some spaceships, and then the story would happen. And then you'd go back out to blow up some more ships, and so on. But with X-Wing, I felt the need to summarize what happens in every mission so far in at least some detail, because I'm not conveying what happened in the game otherwise. It's like going from this... to this. With a massive increase in detail and possibilities, what was once a maze of abstract rooms with little meaning beyond the enemies they contained starts to cohere into something much greater than even the sum of its already expanded parts. Instead of being a simple delivery vehicle for combat, missions in X-Wing have started to resemble the epic space battles they were inspired by. Each mission feels unique in a way that wouldn't be possible with a system as simple as Wing Commander's. With that increase in complexity came a lot of new pitfalls, some of which they really stepped in, but it was worth the risk, and I'd even go so far as to say that the game is better for it, warts and all. They were right to be ambitious in this way. There are just some things about it that they could have done better with hindsight is all. With your X-Wing, defend our command ship, the Calamari Cruiser Defiance. The Star Destroyer Immortal has just entered our sector and is deploying ties. Due to, uh, technical difficulties, we'll have to make do with the recreation of this mission's briefing by Dodonna. Don't worry about it. This mission is nothing but TIE Bombers. So many TIE Bombers. This is kind of an illustrative example of a mission where every enemy really is mission critical, but you know that coming in and they've made it sure it's reasonable to take them all on, so it's not a problem. That's not to say it's easy. You really gotta bust your ass to get them all in time. I ended up having to dump all my shield power to engines in order to go fast enough. Not that there's much to worry about, it really is nothing but TIE Bombers. Part of the Death Star design team is on their way to a rendezvous with the Star Destroyer, Immortal. With them is a squad of stormtroopers, holding them as virtual prisoners on their corvette. There are gunboat and TIE fighter escorts. These will be attacked and drawn off by the X-Wings. You will lead the capture effort. Your task will be to disable the Corvette carrying the design team. A rescue shuttle will drop out of hyperspace as soon as the Corvette has been disabled. Protect the shuttle as it makes its escape back into hyperspace. Nice of Akbar to summarize the story so I don't have to. The gunboats in this mission do not respawn, so you can make things much easier for yourself by clearing out all the fighters before disabling the Corvette. 
I've been making a big deal out of how big and complex the missions are in this game, so something you might be wondering is, how do you keep track of it all? It's an important question to ask. If the game expects you to manage these large-scale, ever-changing battles, it had better give you the tools to efficiently sort through them. Wing Commander had the bare minimum. This simple but efficient radar that told you where to turn to face your target, and two buttons to manage targeting. If you looked at a ship, you would automatically target them, and there was a button to cycle, one way, through all the targets on screen. And finally a button to lock on to the current target so it would stay targeted if you looked away, or at another ship. That's it. And yet it was never a problem, because when there are never more than about six total targets flying around a small area at any given time, that's all you need. X-Wing can have dozens of targets clustered around a massive area, any number of which could suddenly become relevant at any given time. It needs more. So how's this for more? Instead of one radar, you get two. One for things that are in front of you, and another for things behind you. So, does this give us twice as much information to make up for the fact that it takes up twice as much space on the screen? Well, not really, but it does deliver one key piece of info that Wing Commander's single radar didn't, which is just enough to justify it. You can see at a glance if traveling to meet that enemy you targeted will take you towards or away from all your allies. If your rear view has nothing but green dots, it's safe to venture out. If there's a few red dots mixed in there, you'll probably want to deal with those first. There's no concept of a soft lock system. If you select a target, you're locked onto it until you manually switch to another one or it disappears. It makes sense, because while it was convenient in a simpler game like Wing Commander, soft lock doesn't scale up very well. When there are 20 plus targets available, the last thing you want to happen is to lose track of your current one because you looked at something else. As for how you sort through all those targets, you have a few options. The first is a button to target whatever's in your sights. As useful as it is self-explanatory. Although it won't help you if the reason you want to target something is that you don't know where it is. Probably my most used targeting button in this and most space sims is target nearest enemy fighter. Whenever you're not sure what to do next, you could probably do a lot worse than focusing on the nearest enemy. Its use is pretty obvious when you're actively being attacked, but even when you're not, it's useful for gauging who is likely to threaten you or your fleet next. It does have an unfortunate limitation though, which is that as I've mentioned before, they really do mean target nearest enemy fighter, which does not include transports or shuttles. When I'm surrounded by hostile transports and desperately need to get a fix on one of them, I don't particularly care about the fine distinctions between different classes of ship. Not the time. And finally, if those methods don't apply, you could manually cycle forward or backward through every target available. When there are a lot of targets, this is obviously not ideal, but sometimes you have no other choice. There are four preset slots you can use to store targets to be recalled later. Which on the one hand is useful, but on the other hand I resent having to manage myself. And of course, you're not always going to know which targets are worth storing ahead of time. Okay, so it is more, and most of these are welcome additions, but is it enough? No. There are far too many situations where I find myself in a panic, desperately fumbling with the next and previous target buttons to try to find a target on short notice, because there's no better way to do it. The Find Nearest Enemy button stands out as being particularly useful and transformative because it filters the list of all available targets to try to find the most relevant one for a given criteria. Which ship is most likely to be a danger to me right now? It's no wonder this button is now ubiquitous in these kinds of games. I just wish there were ways to filter the targets for other criteria. Storing a reference to one of your escorts is good for getting your bearings, but it won't tell you what ship is most likely to be a danger to them right now. There's a bit of an arms race between the scale and complexity of the missions and the tools used to manage them, and the missions are winning right now. Attack Imperial Supply and Repair Base. Destroy containers and mines. Attack any Imperial freighters that approach the base. General Dodonna has some kind of brilliant plan to locate the Death Star by capturing an Imperial starship. They don't tell us what the next step is yet, or what kind of starship he wants for that matter, but step one is to destroy a supply base so the next ship that arrives will be stranded. And also very, very confused. 
you mean? Where is it? So I'm trying to tell you, kid, it ain't there. It's totally blown away. What? How? Another supply base, another minefield. There are a lot of containers in this one, so I asked my wingman to help out, which meant I got to hear this. Roger, using designated target. Roger, using designated target. Target destroyed. Roger, using designated target. Roger, using designated target. So that's nice. Wingmen are... a thing that exists in this game. Almost every mission gives you at least one wingman, often two, alongside other allied fighters that aren't under your command. They seem to have a lot of trouble hitting enemy fighters, probably for the same reason enemy fighters have a lot of trouble hitting you. The AI just kinda sucks, so they spend a lot of time flying around each other without either side being able to score a kill. Keeping the enemy distracted is helpful in its own way, I suppose. They tell you when you got a missile coming for you, which is nice, I guess, although you'd think your ship would be able to do that on its own. The one situation in which I found them genuinely helpful is when I would order them to focus fire on a large, slow-moving target like these containers or a capital ship. That's pretty hard to screw up, and the cumulative effect of all that extra firepower adds up fast. It probably would have made some of those missions involving cap ships earlier a lot easier if I had bothered to learn the radio commands beforehand. There's really not much to say about wingmen in this game, but if I said nothing, you would probably assume there is something to say, and I just didn't say it. There is an obscure feature involving wingmen that is exclusive to the DOS version of this game, which is somewhat interesting, but I'll leave that as a teaser for when it's time to talk about version differences. Attack the ships providing escort for the Frigate Prime. Your Y-wings will try to destroy the Corvette escort. The A-Wings will concentrate on destroying the TIE Fighter. Beware of the minefield that is surrounding the Frigate Prime. Alright, step two. Take out all the Corvettes escorting the Frigate that just arrived at the now non-existent base looking to be repaired. There's a minefield around the Priam that you may want to clear out a bit, but the worst mistake you can make here is getting too close to the Frigate, so watch out for that. Other than that, there are three Corvettes to take down, so I hope you know about the blind spot trick by now. Your A-Wing is to destroy mines and provide cover for the Y-Wings that are disabling the Frigate Prime. Protect our boarding craft as they storm the Frigate Prime and capture it. Now that the Corvettes are gone, it's time to... clear the minefield out again and use an A-Wing to support a group of Y-Wings tasked with disabling it. If they had just asked me to do it when I was in the Y-Wing, it would have already been done by now. Just saying. time we demonstrated the full power of this station. This station is insignificant compared with the power of the Force. You may fire when ready. Two Karelian Corvettes, Ethar 1 and 2, are being repaired by the Empire. Destroy the gunboat escorts and keep an eye on other enemy fighters. Support the Y-Wing squadrons in disabling the captured Corvettes. Protect our rescue shuttles while they recapture both starships. By looking through the captured frigate's computer, they were able to figure out that the Death Star was being built in a place called the Horus System. But not only was it gone by the time the Rebels got there, the Imperials had a trap waiting for them and managed to capture the two Corvettes they sent. So much for Operation Brain Genius. It kinda tickles me that the idea of the Death Star being linked to prison labor has apparently been around for decades. Hold on, is that supposed to be pronounced despair? Uh, I was gonna say that's a bit silly even for Star Wars, but it's really not, is it? Okay, time to clean up this mess. 
After taking out a few waves of gunboats, two friendly shuttles will jump in to recapture the corvettes, and you'll need to defend them from more gunboats. There's a limited amount of them, and they seem to spawn on a timer, so this mission is actually an example of what I was asking for earlier. The periods in between attacks are kind of boring, but I'd still much rather have that than an infinite gunboat vomit. What? They're not even supposed to be going after the corvettes. My best guess at what happened is that he managed to bait the torpedoes chasing him into hitting the corvette. I don't know if I should be annoyed or impressed. Protect the military supply cache from Imperial attack. Wait for A-Wing Blue Squadron to relieve you. The Death Star is active and nobody knows where it'll pop up next. And also, we need to guard this random ass supply depot. Sure, whatever. The containers are split up into three groups, and as long as 50% of each group is still there when your relief arrives, it's fine. So don't panic like I did when the frigate shows up and immediately blows up a few boxes. Somebody tell past me to stop getting too close to these things. Just focus on taking down the bombers as they appear and it's no problem. The Alliance flagship Independence is under attack and needs our help. Ward off the Imperial forces until the Independence has escaped. The flagship Independence is under attack. Hey, that's the menu ship. Mon Mothma thinks this is the start of the next big Imperial offensive, so everyone is scrambling to get to the rebel base at Yavin. Let's gather everyone up on one planet. That seems like a good idea. Can't think of anything that could go wrong there. Anyway, let's fend off a ton of TIE bombers while respawning gunboats try to distract us. All right, mission accomplished. Time to... uh-oh. Uh-oh. That was close. The direction you need to enter hyperspace from seems to be set per mission. Usually it's clear, but sometimes they'll get cheeky and put a Star Destroyer in the way, so you need to be very careful about where you do it from. I like how that was the exact same cutscene as before, but with a different planet sprite and Vader removed. Very, uh, clever. We'll go with that. Escorted by A-Wings, you are to attack the Death Star's defenses. Destroy the ComSat so that reinforcements cannot be called in. This will leave the Death Star open to a direct attack by Starfighters. Alright, this is it. Time to take on the Death Star. You all know how it ends, but did you know that it started with a bunch of fighters duking it out in open space before the rebels even arrived at the station? It was there, just off screen, trust me. We'll have to destroy them ship to ship, get the crews to their fighters. Shut up, Vader. Don't ruin this for me. Wait, what? The TIE Advance is... an advanced TIE. Yep, that's what I'm going with. They really pulled out all the stops for this one, though. It's got shields, hyperdrive, missiles, the works. What really sets these things apart, though, is their insanely high speed and ability to make turns that should probably leave their pilots dead or at least unconscious from the G-forces. Their strategic role is to annoy me, personally, and they are very good at it. The way they casually zip in and out of range and dance around your crosshairs is just so obnoxious. If you want to destroy a TIE Advance, I recommend shooting a missile at it from far away and hope it gets there before the Advance stops traveling in a straight line, because once they've engaged you, their ability to waste tons of time as you desperately chase them around trying to score a hit is unmatched. Their one saving grace in my books is that from what I can tell, you never have to kill one to complete a mission. Their actual role is quite literally to distract you from whatever you're really supposed to be doing. Speaking of which, it turns out the only thing the game is actually looking for is whether or not you destroy the commsat. So if you haul ass to the satellite while dodging the TAs taking pot shots at you, you could blow it up and head home victorious in under two minutes. That's right, game. I did destroy the sats. 
And with that 12th mission under our belt, that brings the last tour to a somewhat underwhelming. Surprise! It's not over yet. In a twist that will shock anyone who didn't notice that there's an entire menu option dedicated to controlling the detail of the Death Star, we get to fight over the surface of the Death Star. It's, you know, this part of the movie. Engage any TIE fighters encountered on your way to the nav buoy. Destroy all turbo laser gun towers surrounding the nav buoy. Destroy all hangar ports from which the TIE fighters are launched. Our mission here is to destroy four hangars that will infinitely spawn TIE fighters until you get to them, then take out every gun tower within two kilometers of the beacon. The hangars are... camouflaged as cargo containers, which definitely makes a lot of sense and isn't just an excuse for why they reuse an existing model. Anyway, the key to success in this mission is understanding that engaging any of the ties is a waste of time until you've taken down the hangars. Otherwise, they'll just get replaced as quickly as you destroy them. Engage any tie fighters encountered on your way to the nav buoy. I really hate that man. Once you've done that, it's just a matter of methodically destroying all the remaining ties and turrets, which is going to take a while because two kilometers squared is a big area, and there are a lot of turrets. It gets kind of tedious after a while, but I'm sure the scale was really impressive at the time. In your X-Wing, follow the nav buoys to the Death Star Trench. Turn left and descend into the Death Star Trench. Follow the trench to the exhaust port. Use your proton torpedoes. Beware of Imperial TIE Fighters. They will send their best after you. And finally, the big one. Up to this point, we've been playing as generic self-named X-Wing pilot number 32, but I guess we're Luke Skywalker now because it would be pretty disappointing if they didn't let us do this, which, uh, yeah. You didn't think they were going to take us to the Death Star and not let us take a crack at the trench run, did you? Of course not. The way it works is, when you get into the trench, R2-D2 supercharges your engines and causes you to move much faster than normal. Standing in your way are gun towers and random bits of superstructure with some kinda dodgy collision detection. You can destroy every piece individually, which is pretty impressive actually. Although you're going to be taking a lot of damage from the turret, so you'll want to save some laser power to replenish your shields. I think this is one of the few situations where you really can set deflectors to forward without it being a bad idea. Technically, you can leave the trench at any time, but if you do, your speed will go back down to normal because R2 really wants you to enjoy the ride. It's a lot like that old Atari Star Wars game, to the point where it feels like a deliberate reference. Much like that game, you don't have to worry about Darth Vader or any kind of tie interference really as long as you stay in the trench, which seems a bit odd. I guess they couldn't think of a way to make it work without being frustrating or unfair. This whole thing kind of seems like a half-baked last-minute addition, but eh, it holds together just well enough that I'm glad it's here. Even with your boosted speed, it takes a while to get to the end, so it's a real test of endurance. Trying to shoot the towers before they can get a shot off, dodging the bridges, keeping your shields fed, and then when you get to the end, you choke and miss your shot. Okay, look, in the briefing and in most games, the exhaust port is on a vertical wall. But when it actually happens in the movie, it looks like it's flat on the ground or something. It's hard to tell. This has always confused me. Anyway, assuming you don't blow it, the Death Star does, and the game is over. So, about the story. It's barely there, right? But to be honest, I kinda like it for what it is. Let's not beat around the bush. It's because it's Star Wars. It seems downright unfair. Wing Commander goes to great lengths to try to get me invested in the outcome of its missions with in-depth conversations and branching story paths, and I don't care. But X-Wing doesn't bother with any of that, and I do because it happens to be tied to some movies I like. 
but, well, it works. They know what they're doing, though. They take great pains to weave your actions around the events of the movies in a plausible way, so you can go, yeah, I'm the guy who made sure those Death Star plans made it to Leia. It also helps a lot that the mission design has enough going on that it actually feels like I'm participating in the story instead of just watching it happen in cutscenes. And even if I am a faceless nobody accomplishing a bunch of dry military objectives, if they could manage to contextualize why it matters to the characters I know and love, they've won. It's not just about lucking into having a good license, it's about making good use of that license, and what can I say? They do. People have mentioned in the comments that they got really into the universe of Wing Commander thanks to the tie-in novels, so I think Origin did try to provide that kind of additional context to people who were willing to seek it out, but that wasn't most people, whereas you can just assume that everybody has seen Star Wars. It actually is totally unfair, but what are you gonna do, right? Forget it, Jake, it's Star Wars. We're not done yet, though. We've got two expansion packs to cover. They only have one tour each, so we might as well- Yeah, it turns out that each one of these expansion tours contains 24 missions. So when you put those together and combine that with the added historical missions, that comes out to more content than the base game had. I'm afraid we'll have to save these for a possible future video. Instead, why don't we take a look at the different versions of this game, starting with the original DOS floppy disk release. One thing that surprised me about this version is that it talks, at least in the cutscenes anyway. Sir, our TIE interceptors have located a rebel fleet orbiting the planet Torcana. I thought the whole selling point of the CD versions was that they had voice acting, but I suppose it's just more voice acting. One quirk of the DOS versions is that you have to calibrate your joystick every single time you start them up. Very annoying. The menus are as we've seen throughout the rest of the video, except the briefings aren't voiced. Once you get into a mission, you'll notice that it runs at a very crunchy 320x240 resolution. Now, everybody loves their chunky pixels these days, but I actually found this made the game significantly harder to play than it otherwise would be, because you spend a lot of time looking at things that are very small on the screen in this game, either because they're very far away or because they're, you know, TIE Fighters. Or both. So when said far away TIE Fighter looks like this, it can be a problem. Since I'm on the subject, I might as well mention the way this version shows you which ship you have targeted on the main screen, which is a little different from how it is in most of my footage. Instead of those Wing Commander style lock-on boxes, this version makes the currently targeted ship periodically flash red. This method of doing things is, uh, bad. Not only is it ugly as hell, but it's terrible for visibility. It's easy to lose track of your target during chaotic dogfights, and in situations where the target is too far away to be rendered at potato resolution, well, you just can't see it. Maybe that's what this computer display that tells you when your target is on screen is supposed to be for. I genuinely did find it useful for that purpose a few times while playing the DOS version. At least they thought to set a frame rate cap of 30, unlike the DOS version of Wing Commander, so you don't have to worry about the game running too fast. Although there are still some elements of gameplay that can change depending on your CPU speed. When they're not flashing red, the 3D models for the ships are very primitive, using tinted polygons to imply the presence of textures. I've seen some people say they prefer these to the models using the newest version, I, uh, think we'll have to agree to disagree there. These aren't some charming, hyper-stylized interpretations of the ships here. They're just worse versions of the same thing. The sound effects are of a noticeably lower fidelity and kind of off-model compared to the ones in all subsequent versions, with some of them even being generated by your sound card like a MIDI instrument. I don't think they're horrible or anything, but, you know... Time marches on, and then we have the music. X-Wing has the distinction of being the first non-adventure game to make use of LucasArts' famously underappreciated iMuse system. 
Except I've heard so much bloviating over how secretly amazing it is that I think it might have wrapped around to being overrated by now. And my experience with this game is not helping. So, dynamic music. Like when the soundtrack changes based on what's happening on screen. To be clear, that's not what iMuse does. You don't need a fancy name system for that. Wing Commander did that. But listen. There. Did you notice how the song just abruptly changed with no fade out or transition? To be honest, it's not something I ever noticed or cared about while playing, but sure, it could be a bit more polished. What iMuse does is create a suitable transition between the different tracks so that it sounds like one continuous piece of music with no abrupt changes or stops. So here's how it plays out in an X-Wing mission. When nothing is happening, it sounds like this. When an Imperial capital ship arrives, iMuse waits till the end of the current phrase, then plays this motif. But since we were in an idle state before, it can also act as a musical bridge to this more tense theme that plays when the Imperials are around but you're not fighting them yet. All completely seamless. Finally, when you get within 5 kilometers of an Imperial ship, it transitions to the combat theme, which is based on the music that played during the TIE Fighter attack on the Millennium Falcon and A New Hope. Within these three primary themes, the system will randomly stitch together minor variations and extensions to try to add variety. Much like the capital ships, you also get this snippet of the Imperial March whenever an enemy fighter is launched. Along with a similar Alliance themed one for any rebel reinforcements that show up. And of course you get some victory music at the end of a mission. Seems pretty cool, right? So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, that's it. I just showed you all of the music that you're going to hear during typical gameplay. All of it. It's actually worse than that. That first stage idle theme that plays before the imps arrive? Well, this is a game about fighting the Empire, so conditions for that one are obviously a lot rarer than the other two. You'll hear it any time the game wants you to sit through a bunch of rebel docking before the enemy shows up, but that is thankfully not that common. It also doesn't come back when the Imperials leave, so really it's just a whole lot of da 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 and even more da 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 when it comes down to it. I don't care how smooth the transitions are, that is not enough music. I want you to imagine alternating between minuscule variations on the same two 30 second loops for 50 hours. I would die. I'd love to know what happened here. Was it hubris? Did they think that with the power of iMuse they were creating something with infinite variation and people wouldn't get tired of it? Or did all the work of making those transitions take away from the time that would have been needed to create more unique tracks? Or did they just independently think this was somehow enough? To be completely fair, that's not all the music in the game. They do have some special music for the Death Star surface, which is nice. But that's 3 out of 116 missions. Each room in the menu has its own music, and yes, they do transition smoothly into each other.
no complaints there. I also noticed that the maze has its own unique music for some reason. It probably wouldn't have hurt to have this show up in the regular missions occasionally. Just saying. Oh right, there's that mysterious wingman feature that I teased earlier. In the DOS versions of this game, there's this flight group screen before each mission where you select your wingmen. Except they're not predetermined characters, they're whichever other player pilot data you happen to have on your system. Why would you have more than one pilot? Well, most people wouldn't, hence the obscurity of this feature. But I'm sure some people had multiple family members who played the game on the same computer, or maybe they got really bored and decided to start over because that's the kind of thing you would do when you were a kid and your parents only got you one game every six months or so. Anyway, those other pilots show up on this screen so you can have them fly as your wingmen, and their rank determines their AI skill. How noticeable this actually was in practice, I can't really say, but I kind of have my doubts. Perhaps realizing that most people didn't take advantage of or even notice this feature, the developers added the top ace pilot in one of the expansions. I'm pretty sure it was one of the expansions because the original manual doesn't mention it anyway. Top ace is a pre-made pilot with everything unlocked and the highest rank achieved so you can have at least one good wingman at your side without having to create them yourself. I found it useful for sampling various aspects of the game, if nothing else, since I only have my personal clear file for one version of the game, naturally. A year after the original game, they released something called X-Wing Collector's CD-ROM to coincide with the release of TIE Fighter using that game's updated version of the X-Wing engine along with various bug fixes and improvements. This is the version that most people online recommend, but I'm here to tell you, it's not that simple. It's still basically the same game, but with all sorts of miscellaneous changes. The most noticeable one, of course, being the voice mission briefings. They also redid a bunch of the more infamous missions to make them less frustrating. You can toggle between the old and new missions in the options menu, and this carries forward as the default to every subsequent version of the game. If these are the ones that are supposed to be less frustrating, I don't even want to know what the old ones were like. It came with both the Imperial Pursuit and B-Wing expansion packs pre-installed, plus an additional six bonus missions, which makes for a pretty hefty package altogether. The lighting has been improved thanks to the TIE Fighter engine, so now you can actually see differences in shadings across the ship's hull, which helps make them look less flat. The sound effects have been redone to be more like the movies, and they seem pretty good to my ears. There's also more of them in various places. So for example, where before there was only one rebel laser sound, your lasers now sound different depending on whether they're at full power or not, which is a nice bit of feedback. On the other hand, one of the added sounds is this annoying beeping noise whenever you adjust the throttle, which I do a lot, so points to the floppy version there. The music is, surprisingly, an objective downgrade from the floppy version. See, the soundtrack was composed for a specific sound card, the Roland MT-32, just like Wing Commander. There were options for other cards, but they had reduced detail and fidelity. By the time TIE Fighter came out, the MT-32 had fallen out of style in favor of Microsoft's general MIDI standard, and so there was no special support for it. As a result, even if you choose the MT-32 as your sound card in X-Wing CD's settings, you'll get the cut down version of the soundtrack no matter what. I've already explained why this shouldn't really be much of a concern, but considering that the reason why people online will tell you to play this version is so you can experience the majesty of iMuse, it seems worth pointing out. I experienced multiple crashes on the mission debriefing screen in this version, though I haven't tested the floppy version enough to say that it doesn't happen there too. Luckily, the game saves that you completed the mission before you get to this screen, so no real progress was lost, but it's still annoying, and the sound it makes is something else.
1996, Larry Holland's group, which by that point had achieved their final form of Totally Games, released a Mac port of the game. This one is a bit of a curiosity, on account of how obscure and inaccessible it is. Try as I might, I could not get this to work. No matter what I did, it would always tell me the CD wasn't in the drive. I guess that's the copy protection working as intended. It's hard to even find footage of this version. If you search for X-Wing Mac, you'll find a bunch of videos claiming to have it, but when you click through, they're actually just running the PC version on DOSBox. I did manage to find a couple videos of people who managed to get it running. Based on this footage and what little has been written about this version online, I can tell you that it's based on the DOS Collector CD version, but it runs at 640x480. That's double the clarity of the DOS versions, which would have given it a pretty big leg up. Unfortunately, this resolution bump also prompted them to redo the menu graphics, this time in mostly untouched CG. Now, if you look closely at the original menus, you could tell that some elements are CG, while others look like they might be Mortal Kombat style digitized film. But the heavy lifting was done by gorgeously detailed pixel art that conveyed a ton of depth and character. They must have thought that CG had advanced enough over the past three years that it could stand on its own this time. It does not. The remade menu scenes are dreary, severely lacking in detail, and just look like what they are. Primitive early CG. They also cut many of the little animations and flourishes that were in the DOS menus, making the whole thing feel even more barren and lifeless. They've also smeared what remains of the original pixel art, namely the character sprites, with an ugly interpolation filter, because raw pixels were considered unsightly at the time. So, fun fact about the mission briefings. If you use the historical simulator to replay a tour mission, Dodonna gives the briefing instead of Akbar. You know, since the simulator is his domain or whatever. And yes, they did record all the lines for this. Beware of Imperial TIE Fighters. They will send their best after you. I don't know why they bothered, but if you're wondering why all my footage of Akbar is with the new menus, that's why. And for the PS de Resistance, they've special editioned up the intro cutscene. The results of which, I think, speak for themselves. We are under attack by Imperial Star Destroyers. They didn't bother to, uh, improve any of the other story cutscenes in this way. Considering that this carries over to the version I chose to play the bulk of the game with, I am very grateful for that fact. The flight roster menu is gone from this version, never to return. On the bright side, iMuse is still there. The sound font sucks and apparently it can't be changed, but if dynamic music is that important for you, there you go. And that's all the differences I've seen noted. This appears to have been an otherwise faithful adaptation of the DOS Collector's CD version. And finally, we have X-Wing Collector's Series. Not to be confused with X-Wing Collector's CD, though I wouldn't blame you. It's another engine upgrade, this time to the X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter engine, that came as part of a collection of X-Wing, TIE Fighter, and some kind of demo version of XVT in 1998. Or maybe it's what Steam refers to as Special Edition. Or Remastered if you go by the folder names. Oh well, this definitely wasn't the last subtitle crime committed by Star Wars, but it may have been the first. This is the version that those internet people will warn you away from because it uses CD music instead of MIDI, which means no iMuse. It sounds like... well, I can't show you what it sounds like because it's literally just music from the movies arranged into medleys, so just use your imagination. The thing is, it may not have the dynamism of iMuse, but it's a hell of a lot more variety than you get with the MIDI soundtrack and you actually get different tracks occasionally as you progress through the game. I seriously consider this a major upgrade, not even because of the CD quality, but because it's more than a minute's worth of music. 
The intro movie and menu graphics are inherited from the Mac version, unfortunately. Only now the menus have no music behind them. It just keeps getting better, doesn't it? I'm not sure if this is the result of trying to run the game on modern computers or if this is just how it always was, but the lack of music makes it feel even more empty, which is quite an accomplishment. Despite using a much newer version of the engine made for a completely different game, the physics and gameplay are remarkably identical as far as I can tell. I was really expecting to find little differences here and there, but I legitimately could not. I mean, one would hope that they would have made some improvements to the physics and AI in five years, but I don't know. I guess we'll have to see when we get to XVT. It uses all the same mission files from the previous releases, including the option to toggle between the original and the CD ones, so no changes there. Where we do see major differences is in the renderer. In addition to the Mac version's resolution boost, the ship models have been replaced by the much more detailed ones from XVT, complete with textures, and the lighting has been given another overhaul, although it looks a little wonky unless you turn the gamma all the way down. As I mentioned before, this version changes the way that your current target is highlighted. Instead of making the model flash red, it draws a white box around them, which makes it much easier to tell where things are, especially when they're far away. The controls are almost identical, with the exception of one addition, a button to automatically match speed with your current target, which I found to be very helpful for not crashing into things. One change I didn't expect is that you could now hear the engine of your ship. A friend of mine found this to be absolutely unbearable to listen to, so if you're like him, you can turn it off, but I love it. Each of the playable ships has its own sound, which helps further differentiate them, and it changes pitch based on your speed, which is a great little bit of feedback that lets you feel how fast you're moving in addition to seeing it. Flying without it just feels empty, like there's something missing, you know? A notable subtraction in this version is the removal of any way to turn your ship without a joystick. That's right, this version is unplayable without a joystick. It doesn't make a difference for me because an analog stick counts and that's my preferred way to play, but even I can see that this is extremely uncool. Nowadays, even if you don't have a dedicated flight stick, you very likely at least have access to a gamepad that'll do the trick. This was very much not the case in 98. A lot of people mentioned in the comments for my Wing Commander video that they played these games using their keyboards because they didn't have a joystick. It was not an uncommon way to play, so I'm really struggling to see what the rationale for arbitrarily locking those people out was. As is customary with remasters, there are a few new bugs added in. The sprites for stellar objects are drawn at half the size they are in the DOS versions. I'm guessing this is because the equivalent sprites used by XVT are double the resolution, so when you put the original sprites in there, they shrink. It's not the end of the world, though. You can't really tell how big they're supposed to be, so they don't necessarily look wrong. The Death Star is missing from the skybox of the one mission that's supposed to have it. Getting shades of the Kilrathi saga here. The demo recording feature is unstable. Oh, did I mention the demo recording feature? In all versions of the game, you could record your gameplay to be played back later from various angles. It's neat, and I wanted to use it to get some cool third-person shots for the video, but I had to stop when it kept crashing my game. This never happened in my limited testing of it in the CD version, so I'll give the DOS versions the benefit of the doubt and assume that this issue is exclusive to the Collector's series. I also got a consistent crash at the start of exactly one mission, which just so happens to be an optional mission from one of the expansions, which might be the worst mission in the game. A convoy of troop transport is to rendezvous with the frigate Mayhem. B-Wing Red will intercept each ship and identify the passengers. It's a literal nightmare scenario, so I think the game might have just been looking out for me. And since it was released in 1998, this is of course an early Windows game now, using Direct3D. This comes with the usual problems you'd expect to have running such a game on modern computers, but also exposes it to the world of modding. 
I'll put a link to a guide in the description, but suffice to say, not only can you get it working, you can also run it at any 4x3 resolution you want, which clears things up quite nicely. I love PC gaming. Finally, Top Ace has been removed, despite having survived all the way into the Mac version, which is the one that acts the flight roster, if you'll remember. Damn, can't believe they do them like that, after all the hard work you put in for them over the years. Oh well. Annoyingly, there is no definitive version. Each one has its own pros and cons. The floppy version has the best MIDI soundtrack, but is the most primitive in all other ways. The CD version has a downgraded version of that soundtrack, but all sorts of other enhancements, while the special edition loses iMuse, has ugly menus and adds bugs, but has better graphics and notable quality of life features. You're just gonna have to decide what's most important to you. I have no love lost for the MIDI soundtrack, but losing the good menus is a shame. Ultimately though, the menus aren't the most important thing. The time I spend in the cockpit is what matters. So the improved clarity there is why I ultimately chose that version. If you're looking to play X-Wing in 2023 and beyond, it's available on Steam and GOG. Disney, or the arm of it that manages Star Wars games anyway, is one of those publishers that still remembers to regularly put its old games on sale, so watch out for that if you're price conscious. It doesn't matter which storefront you choose, you'll get basically the same experience either way. I went with the Steam version because it happened to be on sale there and not on GOG at the time. In both cases, you get access to the floppy version, the collector's CD, and the special collector's series remastered edition. For the former two, the included version of DOSBox is playable, but to hear the best music, you're going to want to set up DOSBox staging with a set of MT32 ROM files and tell the game to use Roland Music in the included installer program. If you want to try the SCSRE, you probably won't have much luck getting it to run out of the box. Supposedly, the Steam release is a few versions behind the GOG one in terms of attempts to keep this running on newer PCs, but neither of them is going to cut it in the age of Windows 10+. Luckily, there are mods, and guides to using them, one of which I've linked in the description. Should you play X-Wing in 2023 and beyond? If you have to ask me that question, then the answer is no. When I look back at the time I'd spent playing X-Wing, I could say, yes, I did enjoy it more than I did not, so you could probably say that it was worth it. But by how much? There's a cost to be paid for those hours of fun in the form of a considerable amount of homework that you have to do before you can even get started. And even afterwards, the frustrating, flat-out unfair at times mission design, the long commutes, and the docking, oh god, the docking. Something I didn't mention in my Wing Commander video is that before making Wing Commander, Chris Roberts and his team made RPGs. And so it follows that Wing Commander is the kind of space sim that RPG people would make. It's very logical to get a team of flight simulator people to make a space sim. There's obviously a lot of crossover there, but sometimes those outsider viewpoints can be valuable. In those old school flight sims, you would fly to your objectives in real time, then complete them, and then fly back to base. In real time. That's just what you did in those games. So they didn't really think anything of all that downtime, at least not to the point of making a big effort to do something about it. I think I'm just not fully on board with the kind of space sim that flight simulator people would make. While I do appreciate the technological leaps X-Wing made over Wing Commander, I definitely lean way farther towards Wing Commander's design sensibilities, enough so that I still prefer that game overall. It's funny though, when you look at them side by side, it almost feels like these two games could have been switched at birth. Like, Wing Commander was the easy to pick up and play, story rich, relatively speaking, experience that a licensed Star Wars game probably should have been, while X-Wing was the complicated boutique simulator game that Wing Commander maybe could have been. Just a thought. But I think whether or not you would enjoy X-Wing is going to hinge on whether or not you're already in the process of typing up an angry comment about how I didn't appreciate the power management and deflector switching enough. 
If spending a large amount of time learning how to pilot an X-Wing appeals to you, then all that stuff I described as homework would instead be part of the fun, maybe even the main draw. And that changes the equation significantly. So, if you know, you know. But otherwise, there's probably a long list of games in this genre that you should get to first. And that's it. Congratulations, you made it all the way to the end of the video. Maybe you could celebrate by dropping a like and clicking that subscribe button? Hmm? Just thinking out loud. Oh, and check out the Patreon. Chances are it's been multiple days since you saw that part, so don't forget about it. Next video will be about Wing Commander 2. See you then.